Well, I'm glad the snow stopped. <laughs> Thank you for coming uh, this, uh, this afternoon. I'm glad the snow stopped because I uh, flew in from Charleston last night to Philadelphia. And so obviously the flight from Philadelphia to uh, Scranton was canceled. So Terry Lacey and I drove, uh, or she drove rather, <laughs> uh, eight hours. I figured that we were averaging about 10 miles an hour uh, from Philadelphia airport uh, <clears throat> back to, uh, to this area. So we're in one piece, but I heard there were other horror stories that people have shared with me. Uh, four hours going from uh, here to Clark Summit, someone said. Was that, was that you, Steve? It was afternoon, yeah. Oh, and noon, okay. So if that's not traumatic enough, um, I think we can begin our talk today. So it's been 20 years since Felitti and Anda published their landmark paper on adverse childhood experiences and the subsequent at impact that work has had on our field. Those experiences affecting the subsequent development in childhood and adulthood in both behavioral and physical disorders. About a quarter to a third of individuals with significant trauma develop PTSD with a lifetime prevalence of about 8 to 9 percent. It's also been estimated that 80 percent of individuals with PTSD have co-occurring behavioral disorders, notably mood and substance use disorders, and physical health disorders. And one of the remarkable things that I've noticed in this medical school is that the faculty have done a great job of teaching and educating the medical students here and the graduate students about the effect of ACEs on the function of individuals and the functioning in communities. The additive effects of ACEs are associated with negative outcomes increases in smoking, obesity, and a variety of physical problems, including increased risk of cardiovascular, cancer, lung disease, and other physical disorders. Neuroscience is looking at the relationship of inflammatory markers to trauma. Genetics is looking at candidate genes related to trauma, and there is evidence that the microbiome is involved as well. So this is a, these are big ticket items that affect the well-being and the functioning of individuals, and affect the well-being and functioning of communities. So while all this research is going on, the question I have asked myself and others, what are the implications of this body of work for individuals and communities? Why have health systems generally lagged behind in developing strategies to address what appears to be a relatively common scenario? How can we take the concepts embodied in the ACEs work and the impressive accompanying psychosocial and neuroscience efforts and move into positive territory that will promote individual and community health. Some of you are aware of the ambitious project we have been working on for the past year involving resilience, which we feel is the path that will move the needle into positive territory. But this is another topic for another symposium. We're just beginning that work. So the focus today is on what is the future of adverse childhood experiences? How do we take that knowledge 
and apply it to how individuals and communities can raise the water level and improve what's going on in individuals and in the community at large. We have some thoughts about that. And what you're going to be hearing about over the next several months here in Scranton, in Luzerne County, are some thoughts we have about how to move that needle into positive territory. So the topic today is on the future of adverse childhood experiences and the relationship to the building of community resilience. Now I have to say that Brooks Keeshan, who is the second speaker today, and I'll introduce him when the time comes, he's going to be on Skype because he flew from Salt Lake City to Detroit yesterday, but could not get a flight from Detroit to here. So what he did, as a sign of effort, he made that effort, he took a flight at 7.45 this morning from Detroit back to Salt Lake City. So he will be here on Skype, and uh, I'll introduce him at that time. It's a, it's a great pleasure to introduce both Judy and Julian Ford, who are long-standing BFFs. <laughs> they, are, they are our best friends. My, my wife Elizabeth is sitting there with them. Uh, Julian and Judy, we came to know the first day that we both started at Dartmouth uh, Medical School in the mid-90s. And uh, from that time, we've come, uh, become fast friends, and like, uh, like all good friends, we kind of ignore our imperfections and foibles. We don't talk about them very much, and we just accept each other as the people that we are. I think so, right? Think for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, Julian has, a, uh, has had a remarkable career. He, his CV, which I haven't looked at recently, but it has grown to about 50 pages. Uh, and he's a major figure in American behavioral health. He likes to tell me that he used to run when he was at the University of Michigan as an undergraduate in the Arboretum, which is a famous place to run, and he does that uh, <coughs> frequently whenever he goes back there. That's where he received his undergraduate degree. He got his PhD from uh, SUNY Stony Brook. Seems like many years ago, right? Not, no? Okay. But he's held a number of impressive positions in a variety of academic institutions. He's presently professor of psychiatry and law at the University of Connecticut, and prior to that was at Dartmouth, and before then Oregon Health Sciences, and before that at uh, UCLA, I believe. He is the principal investigator on two of the 20 SAMHSA center grants in this country, one on uh, trauma recovery and juvenile justice, and the other on um, treatment of developmental trauma. So he's a major figure. And in addition, he's just, I think last week, he was just had his, uh, he was elected to, the, to be president of the International Society for traumatic stress disorders. So that's, that's, a, that's a big, that's a big uh, responsibility. And, and knowing Julian, he's loving the prospect of having all those meetings that go along with being, a part, being the president of that organization. So um, I'm not going to say anything else, but just welcome uh, Julian Ford. Um, we tried to get him. 
We tried to get Julian to come to this uh, medical school and to the Geisinger system a couple of years ago, but he was too busy building a 75-foot indoor lap pool for his house. <laughs> Julian, okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Huey, um, and LOL. Is that lots of love or lots of laughs? I'm not sure which, but either way. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, Dean Scheinman. It's an honor to be back in Scranton and back at Geisinger Commonwealth, a really remarkable medical school. Um, and it's really great to be able to be a part of this behavioral health initiative, because I heard all about this a year and a half ago, Terry Lacey, who's been really leading that initiative for now over two years. And I know that it's, it's just so unique to actually be working in a community where the whole community is coming together to address these issues of trauma and adversity and to do so in a way that builds resilience. So I'm going to talk with you about a way of understanding traumatic stress because that's my area, post-traumatic stress disorder, and so that I don't get too depressed and so that I maintain some resilience, I have to think about how, how to flip that around and not try to make it into something that's light because it's never light. Trauma is just life-shattering. But it's also a, an opportunity for many people, kids and adults, to be able to actually not necessarily grow. There's something called post-traumatic growth, and I think I'm going to get a little help on getting my slides up here. Thank you. I'm not going to talk to you about post-traumatic growth because I don't think people grow from trauma. I think people grow in spite of trauma. But they grow because they're resilient. They grow because they have hope, because they have, have mastered a skill, which, thank you very much, which most of us are, are, are just novices and beginners at. Trauma survivors, the, the, they are the individuals and the families and the communities that I've learned more from than anyone else in my career. And I, and I did get my PhD more than 40 years ago, so I've been learning for a long time. And truly, it's not the textbooks, no matter how many we write, it's the individuals, the families, who have found a way to get through the kinds of events that, for many of us, it would just be unthinkable. But what they know is what I want to share with you. And it's a good part of the answer to Dr. Huey's question, which is how do you transform adversity into not just recovery and even beyond resilience into thriving. First, you have to understand the impact of adversity. And that's what we'll talk about today. So I have to admit that I'm the co-owner of a small company that makes very little money, uh, but that distributes, and uh, my wife Judy is the president of that company, so she, whatever she says, I do, at work as well as at home. And I won't be pushing that, but I'll be sharing a little bit from that. And here's what we're gonna, we're gonna talk about today, and I'll try not to keep this dry. I think I'm gonna try to give you lots of examples and make this something that, you can, that we can all relate to in our own lives, as well as the, those of the patients, clients, and families and children we care for. So we'll talk about the prevalence of psychological trauma and victimization in community and high-risk populations because there's actually more to adversity than the ACEs. I regret to say that the ACEs, as important as they are, they are 10 different aspects of adversity. And unfortunately, in children's lives growing up and in our lives as adults, we can encounter 25, 30, or more types of potentially traumatic adversity. So it's more than the ACEs, even though the ACEs are a wonderful place to start. And we're going to talk a little bit about post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, but I'll try not to make that boring because it's actually really fascinating to understand what it is rather than just thinking of it as a diagnosis. It's actually a description of how people survive trauma. And when we understand that, then we begin to, help, we begin to know how to help them to do more than survive to not just be living a life of survival, but to be living a life that has more than and is built on the foundation of survival. And we'll talk about something called developmental trauma disorder, which is a reframe of PTSD for children. And it's something that a group of us have been working on for about 15 years in the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, which Dr. Huey mentioned, that's where my centers are located with uh, 
20 or so other centers all across the country and another 60 centers that are in communities. Um, so if you are interested in hearing more about the National Child Traumatic Stress Network and the incredible resources it has, we can certainly talk about that in the panel discussion. Or you can go to nctsn.org, National Child Traumatic Stress Network, nctsn.org. Great resources. Then we're going to talk about the brain because many of you know a lot more about the brain than I do. And I want to share with you what I've learned about the brain that is in directly relevant to trauma and recovery and resilience. And it also gives us a way to talk with people who've experienced trauma to help them understand how trauma has changed them. So they don't think of it as damage, they think of it as an adaptation that makes sense. That's just what the brain does in order to help us get through situations that we had never expected and that we don't know we can make it through. Our creative brains are incredibly powerful and that's a tool for education that's incredibly powerful. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about how you can use this knowledge to help the clients and the patients you work with, the community members who you advocate for and who you support, and maybe even in our own lives because we don't have to be trauma survivors in order to learn from the wisdom of trauma survivors. And that's one of the greatest things that we can do as an acknowledgement of our respect for trauma survivors is be learners rather than being the, only the caregivers or the teachers. They have so much to teach us and I will show you what I've learned. So in case you need some extra reading, um, late night reading puts you to sleep. So here's a, here's a couple of books that my colleagues and I have put together on these topics. So if you want to go in some more depth, here's one on treatment of complex trauma and tra traumatic stress disorders. Here's one that a group of us put together on tr complex traumatic stress disorders with children. It's a fascinating collection of articles by some of the really smartest people in the field. Okay, so how prevalent is trauma? Well, as Dr. Huey said, it's highly prevalent. It used to be thought of as a, an experience that was outside the normal range of human experience. It's not. It's outside of the range of our expectable experience for most of us if we're fortunate. But it is not outside the range of ordinary human experience because more than half of all people in this country and, and worldwide, and sometimes it's far more than that in settings that are war-torn or where there's substantial poverty or where racism and stigma add to the, the, the burden of just physical dangers and health-related problems. But just 61% of all individuals in this country will experience a traumatic stressor and 60 plus percent of children. And by the time that they're adolescents, again, another study, so we've got converging evidence saying that almost two thirds of all adolescents in this country will have experienced at least one traumatic event and very often more than one. So, and 5% of those adolescents will develop what's called post-traumatic stress disorder, which we'll talk about. But that doesn't mean that the 95% who don't develop PTSD are unaffected. It just means that they don't have all the symptoms that are required for that particular diagnosis, but they are affected. Back to the ACEs for just a moment, just to, again, reprise some of the work that Dr. Felitti and Dr. Anda and their, and their wonderful group have done, just to give you a sense of its physical health problems, but it's also some of the most dangerous and some of the most serious mental health concerns and behavioral health concerns with every single type of adversity that a child has experienced. In adulthood, their likelihood, their risk of developing alcohol abuse problems, having a suicide attempt, or developing severe anxiety. Just three examples, but it, it runs the gamut. It's every single psychiatric condition is in exacerbated risk by exposure to childhood adversity, not caused by, but the risk is increased. So this is just a quick sample, but these are some of the most serious and concerning problems. And you can just see the step, the staircase, as it goes up with every additional type of adversity, not incident. Each of these types of adversity may have occurred for years. They may have occurred dozens of times in a child's life. But then you add on one another another. And by the way, the ACEs include essentially 
abuse, sexual or physical abuse. They don't specifically include emotional abuse, although that is very toxic and often goes hand in hand with sexual or physical abuse. It includes exposure to violence in the family and in the community. It also includes living with a caregiver who's impaired by mental health problems, by substance abuse problems, or by legal and other kinds of problems. So adverse childhood experiences really have to do with children not being able to feel safe in their own homes. And again, it is not because their parents are bad people. They are struggling and they are doing their best. And in many cases, it's intergenerational, multiple generations. Most of the clients who I work with in, in providing psychotherapy for traumatic stress disorders, we trace back the, the traumatic exposures through multiple generations. And we can see how it just kind of trickles down. It's not one generation traumatizing the next. It's one generation being susceptible and vulnerable, another generation then following in that path. And that's what we really have. We have multiple generations. Now, of course, we also have to consider that for many communities and many subgroups within communities, there is not just intergenerational trauma, but there's historical trauma, trauma that goes back decades and centuries that involves mass kinds of exposures to violence, to genocide, to slavery, to displacement. And of course, tragically, we see that happening now in our, in our world. It's not a thing of the past, but it leaves a historical footprint. And a person with that background in their family and their community is going to be more ready to survive in a positive sense, but also that's taxing on the body in ways that we'll talk about. So survival is something that people learn how to do in order to make it through adversities, often over many generations. But the cost of survival is what we call traumatic stress. So if that isn't challenging enough, there is a subgroup of children in our country and in many different countries. I've seen studies on this from pretty much every country, every continent in the world. Something called polyvictimization. Again, not to throw a bunch of labels at you, but these are kids and teenagers who have experienced multiple types of, not just adversity, but victimization. Violence, bullying, family violence, community violence, abuse in many cases, neglect, but also sexual trafficking, other forms of exploitation, social media can contribute to this. So poly victims are maybe one in 10, sometimes in certain populations, maybe more like those in juvenile justice and other populations who are highly vulnerable, more like one in four or five, who are kids who've experienced, as you can see, from a survey that David Finkelhor did of just ordinary children in this country, all across the country, nationally representative sample, that 10% of these nationally representative children were poly victims who'd experienced nine or more types of victimization by the time they were six. Types of victimization, not incidents. And 15 or more types by the time they were 15. It's just, it's almost incomprehensible. The, the burden that that places on a child to have to cope with that much danger, threat, uncertainty, and in many cases, absence of protection. We found in another study, looking back at some of the data from a study that was done by the Medical University of South Carolina, a national survey of adolescents, and we found that about 8% of them were poly victims. And you can't see all of this, but just look at the chart and look at the line that keeps going up, peaking up, that dark, that black line. Those are the poly victims. And these are types of potentially traumatic experiences. And you note that there are 24 of them, not 10. And they range from life-threatening accidents and illnesses on one side, on the left-hand side, all the way up to violence, abuse, profound neglect, exploitation. The kids who are poly victims very often had experienced life-threatening accidents. That's that peak on the left-hand side. But they'd also often experienced losses that were traumatic, separations from caregivers, and direct victimization uh, as violent survivors, as well as abuse. 
And those were the kids who then reported just an overwhelming number of behavioral health problems. Depression, anxiety, substance use problems, the whole range. Not because there's something wrong with them, but because something had happened to them. Many things had happened. And of course, kids who are already involved in the mental health system, because they have mental health or behavioral health difficulties, they're at particularly high risk. Not because of anything about them, but because of the situations in which they're living in many cases. And in, in one sample that we worked with through uh, a program, the Devereaux Foundation in Massachusetts, that is a residential program for children who have serious mental health problems as well as child protection concerns, family safety concerns, over half of them were poly victims. And they had histories of abuse and impaired caregivers, and on top of that, multiple out-of-home placements. Never underestimate the impact of being separated from primary caregivers and from your home. I'm sure you all know that. But that's something that's not always registered on the adversity or the, the trauma scale. And yet that's very, very powerful. Because not having that protective caregiver and not having that sense of secure connection with a protective caregiver can be one of the most scary and unsettling things that can happen to a child on top of direct danger. And kids in detention. So another group that I've been privileged to work with, some of the most resilient, smartest kids I've ever met, much smarter than me, uh, as they, they, they will tell me, Doc, you don't know my life, you're from the suburbs. And they're right. I don't know their life, but I get to know them when they're willing. And what they've taught me is that they know all about resilience. It's just that that's on the top of their priority list, Maslow's hierarchy. That's right up at the top. <laughs> Things like getting along with teachers at school, not so high. Important, because they want to graduate. But you know, when push comes to shove, if you get pushed, you're going to shove if you've been in a situation of adversity. So of those kids, 41% were poly victims, almost half. And that's the, the black line here, where you see just the number of different types of potentially traumatic events that they'd experience. Again, all the way from unintentional, non-interpersonal traumas, accidents, illnesses, losses, and then all the way out along the scale, which I'm, I'm sorry you can't read that, uh, but you can check the slide out later, to interpersonal traumas. Violence, victimization, exploitation, abuse, neglect, those are the kids who had experienced almost everything. So that's the bad news. Part of the good news is, what do we know about the brain? Well, here, Martin Teicher is a brilliant neuroscientist at Harvard. And he did, in this paragraph, I think, one of the best summaries of how people adapt to traumatic stress. Okay? This is based upon hundreds of neuroimaging studies, not with people in trauma situations, but people who have experienced childhood maltreatment in most cases, often have post-traumatic stress problems or full PTSD. And the way he explains it is, is very strikingly similar. When you, when you have input to the brain, of course, first from the sensory organs, first it's gated through the thalamus, we all know that, and the sensory cortex starts to organize and categorize that information. And then if there's an indication of potential threat, and it might be just a little threat or it might be an enormous traumatic threat, the amygdala, the alarm in the brain, which I will show you in a moment, kicks in, okay? But the prefrontal cortex, the area right behind the forehead, that's the area that can actually dial up or dial down the amygdala. I'll show you again a picture in a moment that makes this a little bit clearer, but I just want to give you the summary to show you that this is based on neuroscience, not just on the whims of a clinical psychologist. Okay, And the prefrontal cortex can regulate the amygdala. And in, in addition, at the same time, when the amygdala is activated, very often, typically, the hippocampus right next door to it is activated. Okay, and We call those the alarm, the amygdala, the memory filing and retrieval center, or sometimes the search engine of the brain, the hippocampus. And again, this is a bit of an oversimplification, but it's pretty true to this neuroscience. And then the thinking center. That is the area of the brain that where we do our conscious thinking, the prefrontal cortex or cortices, all right? 
So the hippocampus draws on memories, essentially, from all over the brain and helps us to figure out what the context is. Do I need to do something? It's a remarkable scheme run by firefighting agency California. I think that might be Dr. Kishin, I'll bet you, joining us. So if your alarm just went off in your brain, that's not trauma, but that's what the amygdala does. It says, pay attention. There's some other noise here, and I don't want you to be too distracted, but that's good. See, you, can, you don't have to be a trauma survivor to have an amygdala and to have an alarm reaction. And sometimes having somebody go and figure out how to turn down the volume or mute the external speakers is a great way to actually translate that. And there you go. Now we have meaning and recovery and a little bit of resilience. <laughs> Okay, I don't ask. I don't ask for this to happen, but I can't tell you how many times I've done this presentation or talked with groups, including clinical groups, about this. And right in the middle of it, the fire alarm goes off, and it's like, okay, that's just what's happening. But imagine that it's not the fire alarm in the auditorium, but it's an invisible, inaudible to anyone else alarm that only you can hear, an alarm that's telling you you got to do something. Something terrible is going to happen, is happening, will happen, and you don't know what, but you've got to do something, okay? Imagine having that alarm going off all the time in your brain. That's post-traumatic stress, okay? That didn't drive Dr. Scheinman away. He has an appointment. He let me know that, okay? And he'll be fine, okay? So when the alarm goes off, if the memory filing center, the hippocampus, draws on memories that enables you to, to recognize the context as one of safety, or where you know how to handle the situation, even if it's dangerous, that then ratchets down the amygdala. But if it doesn't, if that prefrontal cortex message doesn't get to the amygdala, or it doesn't signal that this is handleable, you're safe, or you can deal with this, then the alarm is just going to keep escalating. And that, I submit to you, is the best explanation I've ever heard of post-traumatic stress. It is an alarm in the brain that has been turned on by legitimately dangerous situations and circumstances, often over years of a child's or an adult's life, that is not getting reset. And so our job is to help people who are trauma survivors, first of all, understand that's what's different about them. And their bodies feel it too because the amygdala, as Dr. Teicher says, signals that fight-flight response, the stress response, and that's what leads us to then feel that sense of being on edge or totally shut down and exhausted, or just give up, I can't, I can't handle this, overwhelmed. That bodily response is all triggered in by an amygdala, and if you have an amygdala that has hijacked your brain, then you need some help in figuring out how to regain control over your own brain. But there's not anything damaged in your brain. It's a brain that's functioning as it should, but it is not resetting, and it's Remarkable as that may seem, that's the key to recovery and resilience in the face of trauma, the ability to reset that alarm in the brain. So we'll talk about how that can be done. But first, I have to tell you a little bit more about how this all manifests. I think I'm not going to go through that, but let me tell you briefly. Here's, here's a quick guided tour through PTSD, okay, so that you will not be afraid of it. And so that you will not also think that it's just something that happens once in a while to people who just have horrible situations in their lives. These are symptoms that can happen to anyone at any time. They happen very often along with physical health problems, along with behavioral health problems. And they're often embedded in those physical and behavioral health problems in ways that you have to look carefully to see. And if you don't see them, it's not that you won't give the right diagnosis, but you're going to miss an opportunity to help that individual with part of their recovery from whatever other physical or behavioral health problems they are dealing with. PTSD is not something separate from other conditions of physical and behavioral health. It is an underlying challenge that coexists with probably a majority of our clients and patients' other difficulties. And if we can help them to to deal with the stress reactions they're having, those alarm reactions, that can help them in their recovery from physical illness as well as from behavioral health problems. So PTSD, in brief, is unwanted memories. We call it intrusive re-experiencing. As you can see from the slide, it can happen when you're awake. 
It happens typically when you're reminded of something and you don't even know that you're having a reaction. You just know you don't feel right or this doesn't feel like a good situation. So most intrusive memories are not full memories. And actually very few of them are flashbacks where you literally think that it's happening all over again. Mostly it's just a sense that I don't feel right, this is not safe, or I just can't handle this. And that's where it's so confusing for trauma survivors because very often they think that it's because they just can't handle their school or they can't handle, they can't deal with people and relationships. And it's really not that they can't handle those ordinary challenges and stressors. It's that their brain is busy trying to protect them and they don't know it. They've got two things going on. They're trying to live a normal life or an ordinary life that we're all trying to live, and they're also, their brain is busy trying to keep them from being killed. Remarkable as it sounds, it's that difficult. So those intrusive memories are basically the, the brain, the hippocampus, pulling back up memories, essentially to say, be careful, you know, just in case. Maybe something bad's gonna happen. And that's the last thing that a person wants to think or feel. I don't want to go back to those memories. Why do they keep coming up? Well, it's because my brain and my body are trying to keep me protected and on guard, which is not a good thing if you don't need to be on guard, but it's a necessary thing if you're in danger. Well, if you're having unwanted memories and you just can't seem to get them out of your mind and your dreams are affected and you just can't ever feel like you're really safe or you can relax and concentrate, then naturally you're gonna to try to avoid thinking about anything that triggers those memories. So that's another set of symptoms, but it's just a natural reaction. There's nothing pathological about that, it's common sense. Unfortunately, it doesn't work, because the more you try not to think about something, the more you'll think about it. That's how the brain works. The more that we try to avoid situations or conversations or movies, or TV shows, or anything, anniversaries, places, that are reminders of traumatic experiences that we've had, the more that we're priming our brain to access those very memories. So avoidance is intended to protect against those bad memories, and in, paradoxically, it actually amplifies them and escalates them. So that's then a crucial thing to know. We're trying and treating post-traumatic stress to help people get out of this vicious cycle of terrible memories that are there because their brain is trying to protect them and avoidance of those memories, which then makes the memories even stronger and more, more likely to occur. We're trying to get them out of that vicious cycle, and we'll talk about how. Well, if this is happening, then I hardly need to tell you that you're probably going to be experiencing some very, very difficult and unpleasant emotions. Your thoughts are gonna be geared toward, can I trust? No, I can't. What do I have to do to protect myself? Why is this happening? What's the matter with me? So long and short of it, this is where people develop what are called exaggerated negative expectations, but they're really not exaggerated. They are based on traumatic experiences. And they may not be exactly relevant or exactly appropriate to today's experience, but they are relevant to what you have been through. And that's, again, the, the crucial thing to keep in mind. Trauma survivors don't exaggerate their negative beliefs. They have negative beliefs that are intensified by experiences that people who haven't experienced trauma don't understand. And we have to be careful about not judging that or joining with a trauma survivor and judging themselves. They are rational beliefs. They are just not necessarily the most useful at this particular moment, as simple as that sounds. And of course, that's just gonna to lead to a lot of emotional difficulties and loss of interest, anhedonia, feeling like you just can't get close to other people. So you can see how this spreading kind of phenomenon of hypervigilance can intrude and infect a person's entire life. And that's ultimately what the, the final set of PTSD symptoms are, they're hypervigilance. And either hypoarousal, hy excuse me, hyperarousal, always on edge, ready for anything, prone to anger and irritability as a result, not getting enough sleep, not getting good sleep, not getting REM sleep, so therefore even more irritable and prone to anger. So we don't have people who have anger management problems here. We have people who have stress reactivity challenges and it's affecting their emotions and it's keeping them on edge and as a result, they may be more prone to anger or they may be more prone to anxiety. And they may have difficulties with sleep so often because 
What's the most vulnerable thing that you can do in your life? It's not being close to another human being, even though that's right up there. It's not coming to a lecture in a, a very nice, safe place. The most vulnerable that any of us are is when we're asleep. Because then we literally can't protect ourselves consciously. And so very often people who have post-traumatic stress difficulties don't sleep or sleep very, very shallowly and are constantly waking up and they don't know why. They don't realize that it's their brain saying, hey, don't let down your guard. Okay, that's bad. Oh, and then sometimes this leads to difficulties where a person just simply has TMI, too much information more than I can deal with. And that's what triggers what we call dissociation, where a person isn't hyper-aroused and hyper-vigilant and ready for anything and, and on edge and on guard or anxious, but where they just are shut down. Think of dissociation as where the individual basically, mentally and physically, they are basically checked out. They're present physically, but they're not present in the sense of being able to actually know where they are and who they are and what they're doing partially or fully. And dissociation, again, is just another survival tactic. It's the brain basically saying, this is too much information, that's it, <coughs> tune out. So there's nothing mysterious about it, even though it's a very challenging clinical problem. Okay, how does this play out with children before we get to the good news? Just a, f a few more bad parts, okay? It's m even more complicated with children, and we've called this, we coined the term, Bessel van der Kolk and Robert Pinus, Toying the term originally developmental trauma disorder. And it begins with victimization, as we've been talking about, but also when there is a profound separation or a loss of security in the relationship with primary caregivers. Those two phenomena in combination render a child truly, truly vulnerable because they don't feel safe and they don't feel protected and they're facing things that they don't necessarily know how to deal with. Or they learn how to deal with it, but only the hard way. So for kids, it's not just the PTSD symptoms that I've been talking about, the bad memories, the avoidance of those memories, the, the emotional distress that this all creates, and then the sense of never being able to let down your guard. It's also, they just, as they're developing, they don't have the opportunity to develop the capacities as fully as they would otherwise be able to, to just be able to sift through their emotions to tune their emotions, to draw on parts of the prefrontal cortex and other parts of the brain that allow us to actually intensify or downshift our emotions or be able to shift from um, an emotion that's really unpleasant and distressing to an emotion that gives you a sense of hope or interest. And so that ability that we all take for granted to be able to just get through times where our moods are, are negative that's something that kids who are experiencing this kind of victimization and loss of protection or absence of protection, they're too busy surviving and their brains are too busy surviving to really perfect the art of emotion regulation. So they have to then fall back on more basic strategies like just get angry or make sure that if, if you're not getting what you need, you let people know because they're not gonna pay attention otherwise. So now we have kids who get identified as oppositional defiant, okay? Or pay attention to everything that you need to pay attention to so that nothing else bad happens to you or your brother or your sister or maybe you'll get reunified with them if you're placed in a foster home and you haven't seen them for a while or maybe you'll be able to go back with your parents again if you're placed in a foster home or a residential treatment program. And with a brain so busy doing that, how's a kid supposed to concentrate on just ordinary things? So it looks like they're distractible, it looks like they're not paying attention, like they can't focus their attention at school, can't stick with tasks. But what they really are doing is they're paying exquisite attention, unconsciously, to any potential source of threat. And their brain is busy. They're not empty-headed, and they are not ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Although sometimes there is a hyperactivity component, and that's separate. The two can go hand in hand, but they are not the same thing. This is not attention deficit. This is attention being drawn to a particular agenda, which is how do I stay safe? How do I not let that thing happen again and not be prepared for it? How do I make sure that I protect my parents because 
they, they can't protect themselves or me. How do I deal with these dilemmas which for us as adults would be overwhelming? Think of how challenging it is for a kid. So they're not really focused on how do I feel happy when I'm not feeling so, so happy. They're more focused on how do I get through today? How do I get back to where I need to be and with, I, with whom I need to be and keep people safe? It's amazing. You think of how kids who are trauma survivors, they have so much going on in their brains and we can't tell them to stop thinking about that because they can't stop thinking about it. But what we can do is we can help them to begin to add in some ways of thinking that help them to begin to shift their emotions without telling them that what they're feeling is wrong or bad or that it's a, a psychiatric problem, because it's not. It's a survival adaptation. So then, of course, it's hard to also regulate the body. And so these are often kids who have lots of health complaints Sometimes they're very clearly physically, they can be medically diagnosed. Other times they go beyond what seems to be the case medically and, and or are just not easily diagnosed or treated. And again, you can see it's the impact of stress on the body. Something that Bruce McEwen, a scientist at Rockefeller University, is called allostatic load. If you don't know that term, don't worry about it. But if you do, it's basically just a way of saying, when, our, when we are subject to enormous amounts of stress, our bodies have to regroup and mobilize. And that takes a lot of bodily resources. It puts a load on the body. Allostatic means the body's ability to maintain a healthy kind of stability, stasis. So the allostatic load is you're dealing with so much stress that your body can never really relax. Even if it looks like you're just not paying any attention and you're daydreaming, these are kids who, they're not relaxed. They may be freezing and ready for something else to happen, but they're not relaxed. And that takes an enormous amount of physical energy. So with that, of course, then it's going to be difficult to maintain your sense of where you are and who you are and what you're doing. And that can lead to, absolute, to frank problems with dissociation. It certainly makes it hard to even think in terms of emotions when your basic emotion is I'm either bored or I don't feel anything or I'm completely enraged. Again, I'm telling you some of the more extreme forms so that you get the sense of this. I'm not saying that every child who's experienced trauma or adversity is going to have all of these difficulties, but many do. And any one of these difficulties can become an enormous challenge for a child growing up and developing. And of course, it, focus, it then kind of sifts over into their attention, as we've been talking about. And these are often kids who don't really pay attention to danger, amazingly enough, consciously. Or they are, take the attitude of, bring it on. After what's happened to me, so what, you know? I can go out there. I can ride my bike in traffic. I can hang out with people who I know have guns or are dangerous. No problem. I know how to handle that. After what I've been through, this is easy. Well, it's not easy. But there can be that attitude of, after what I've been through, it doesn't really matter. Go ahead, hurt me. Or you can't hurt me. And so these are kids who, on the one hand, are hypervigilant about danger, and on the other hand, can often appear to be completely unaware of massive amounts of danger in their lives. And it's because they're so busy guarding against the threats that have occurred in their past life and previously in their life that they don't, they don't really have a lot of time or even necessarily feel that's high priority to worry about current threats because those are just my life. And again, these are kids, poly victim kids, who will often say, trauma? I don't have any trauma. Yeah, you know. People in my family yell a lot and, you know, they beat each other up. And, yes, there, there are lots of times where I'm not sure if I'm going to wake up and find a body on the floor. And, again, this is an extreme version, but it's very similar. And they're basically saying, it's not trauma to me, it's my life. But it is trauma. We need to know that. We don't need to tell them that, but we need to know that. And they are on edge and hypervigilant even if they think they're completely chill because they have to be. And that's what's keeping them from concentrating. That's what's keeping them from feeling the kinds of feelings that they want to feel that give a person a sense of hope and purpose and connection. And it's nothing that they're doing wrong. It's just that they're in survival mode. And so, of course, 
They'll often then resort to things like maladaptive forms of self-soothing, which can include addictions, but it can also include self, uh, self-soothing behaviors or even self-harm, which is a form of self-soothing, tragically enough, where adults or kids who intentionally hurt themselves, very often what they're doing is not inflicting pain. They're actually trying to contain pain. And the physical hurt that I feel in my wrist or my legs or when I bang my head, that's better than this massive, overwhelming sense of frustration, of confusion. So actually, self-harm tragically becomes a way of reducing pain, even though it has awful consequences. And this can also, of course, then, with all this going on, how is a kid supposed to set goals and achieve goals? As one of the boys who I met at our trauma clinic said, first time he came in, he sat down, 16-year-old, um, and again, I, I won't tell you any personally identifying information. Um, he said, first thing he said was, okay, doc, I know you want to you talk to me about my goals. I don't have goals. I don't do goals. Are we done? <laughs> and I said, I get you. I hear you on that. We're not done, but fine. Okay, we're, we won't be talking about goals. Well, it turns out he had a lot of goals, but his main goal was just how to neg- navigate each day. His secondary goal was how to be a marriage counselor for a couple of his foster parents. About three placements ago, he'd been with a couple, and he'd really bonded with them. And then, of course, he got kicked out of that placement, un- tragically, as so often happens with, with kids. And he's continued to stay in contact with them, and he literally would tell me about how he would talk with them to try to negotiate so that they wouldn't split up. He was their marriage counselor. So there you go. There's a kid who, on the surface, it seems like he wants nothing to do with anybody or any relationships. He seems to be kind of callous and and unemotional. That's a term that's often used about kids involved in juvenile justice. But he's not callous and unemotional. He's extremely emotionally connected, but he's, he's walled off. And... His connection is, I've got to prevent bad things from happening. And I've got to try to protect the few people in my life who I feel have actually been there for me, even if they're not there for me now. See how complicated this is. So he had great goals. We talked about some of his other goals, which I may get to or may not. But he had some really remarkable goals in addition that he wasn't even really aware of and abilities to. He was so busy being a survivor and a protector. And as a result... This affects kids' sense of who they are. These are are kids who then grow up believing that they're damaged, that there's something wrong with them, fundamental, and they can end up even hating themselves, tragically. Maybe not saying so, but like another client of mine said, I would look in the mirror and I I couldn't look at that face. I, I, I had to look back behind. I just couldn't look at that face. I just didn't want to see she's so ugly. And, of course, that's not true, but that was how she felt internally. So for her, it was true. And, of course, this is going to make for some intense attachment insecurity, so relationships are going to be constantly tested, and that's why it seems like these are kids who don't want to be in relationships when, in fact, they're actually incredibly relationally oriented in most cases. And a lot of distrust, a lot of defiance, so there's your oppositional defiance and even conduct disorder and aggression at times, because sometimes the best defense is a good offense. Again, not to justify it, and we're not accepting these as as appropriate behaviors, but these are forms of self-protection or standing up for others to protect others, which is often the case too. And then as a result, very often there's a lot of confusion because kids growing up in this way, they, they either feel like they're sort of so close to others, like this young man who he felt like he was still part of this family even though he really couldn't be. But emotionally, he was in some ways. But boundaries become very, very muddied. And they can, kids who have been, had these experiences can be very vulnerable to exploitation because of that. And they, sometimes they, they literally won't allow any kind of connection at all, even though they're desperately seeking it. And it's often very difficult under these, situa- under these circumstances. Can you imagine how hard it is to take someone else's perspective? when you're just trying to understand your own, and it's so confusing. So that's developmental trauma disorder. We've done a field trial, which I won't go through all the details of. We've got a couple of articles that have just been published. We surveyed several hundred kids. Excuse me. First, we surveyed clinicians all over the world, um, and they told us that, in brief, 
so, I, so as not to bore you, um, I can give you the details later, that these symptoms of devel developmental trauma disorder were similar to post-traumatic stress disorder, but they were uh, above and beyond. So there's more than even PTSD that we're dealing with. And they include exactly the kinds of problems that I've just described as part of developmental trauma disorder. And that, then we, we subsequently have done an interview study with kids from several different parts of the country, actually two waves of it. In the first wave, 236 kids and their parents. And we developed an interview to assess this developmental trauma disorder as well as PTSD. We found that it's a pretty cool interview. It's got some pretty good psychometrics. If you want to hear more about that, I'd be glad to, but probably most folks don't want to. Turns out that when, we, when a colleague did some very fancy, what's called latent class statistical analyses, it turns out that, excuse me, confirmatory factor analyses first. It turns out that this measure actually measures three specific things that are exactly, well, not exactly, that are very close to those three domains that I just talked to you about. Affective regulation, behavior and behavior dysregulation, intentional, and self and relational dysregulation. So it turns out that we can actually measure this. And when we looked at kids in our survey, we found that yes, indeed, there were a, a group of poly victims, but there are also a group of kids who experienced a number of different types of traumas, but not necessarily all. That's the middle line, and some who'd experienced very few. So we had a good sample here of not just trauma survivors or not just poly victims. And what we found basically was that when we look at each of those components of developmental trauma disorder, that each one is very specifically related to other kinds of problems uh, and specifically to the amount of trauma that a child had experienced. So that's what this is basically saying. And these are the other kinds of problems, problems with emotion, Expression, alexithymia is what it's called. Problems with impulse regulation and problems with just overall dysregulation. So basically what we've got here is we've got a bunch of kids, not a bunch, but we've got kids who have experienced high, high, heavy, heavy loads of trauma and adversity. And they have these difficulties. So what do we do? So here is what we suggest that all of us can do. Two things, we can spread some useful information, we call it psychoeducation, you can call it anything you want, and it's basically the message that I just gave to you earlier, but I'll show you some nice ways of explaining that about the brain and stress response system. And then we can teach and model and use ourselves some really powerful recovery skills that are a part of every treatment for PTSD, but not always clearly articulated. So we've this is a, an intervention that we've developed called TARGET, Trauma Affect Regulation Guide for Education and Therapy. If you're interested, we've got a number of published studies. Here's a book that you can get on Amazon probably for 50 cents. I'm not sure. It's not a, not a big seller, um, but this is a, an attempt that a life coach and minister, John Wartman, and I did to actually explain this in down-to-earth terms without all the highfalutin psychology or psych psychologism. And here's what we explain in this intervention and in that book. Basically, we show people the brain, and there you go. And there's the three centers I told you about. So there's the alarm deep in the middle of the brain, closely connected to the spinal cord, where messages can go down to the body and activate the stress system. And there is the filing center, the hippocampus, right next to it, right ready to draw out memories when your alarm goes off and you got to figure out what's going on. You draw memories from the hippocampus. And there's the prefrontal cortex a little bit of a distance away. That little bit of distance makes all the difference. So how does normal stress, how do we adapt to normal stress? Well, basically our brains are brilliant. The alarm goes off and signals pay attention. The hippocampus, the filing center, gets activated to tell us what's going on, the context, what's the situation, before we're even consciously aware of it. That's where you get that intuitive sense of, hmm, is this okay? Should I be walking down that path? Should I be listening? Should I be leaving? Should I be talking to this person? Do I like this person or not? Those intuitive feelings that we all have that before we even are, are aware of them, that's because our memory filing center is drawing on memories because our alarm has said pay attention. And then if that information gets sent up to the prefrontal cortex, 
And the prefrontal cortex gets a message of, this is manageable. You know what's going on. You can handle this, even if it's difficult. The prefrontal cortex then is activated in a way that actually resets the alarm. And that's that arrow underneath. What is post-traumatic stress or developmental trauma disorder? It's an alarm system that is hyperactivated by experiences, not by the person, but by what happens to the person or the community or the family. And a filing center that then is essentially spewing out all kinds of memories about threat, danger, horrible things, <coughs> worst possible memories, and a thinking center that's crashed. So you're not thinking clearly. You may even be dissociating and not even aware of what you are thinking. Or at the best, you're thinking, I got to do something. Ready, fire, aim. That's in a, in a nutshell. And when we show this to trauma survivors, they say, oh, yeah, that's, that looks like my brain. That's, that's what happens to me all the time. And you're saying to me that that's, that's just normal? That's what happens? In brain? That is normal when you've been through traumatic experiences. It's not abnormal. And it makes sense. The, impro the problem is that now your alarm is running your life. And you're reacting, even though you have the ability to reset that alarm, the alarm has taken over to protect you for the best of all possible reasons. So what do we do then? Well, of course, the $64,000 question is, how do I reset the alarm in my brain? And I'll give you a brief guided tour, but essentially it's these seven steps which spell freedom. Okay? And they basically are seven different ways of doing the same thing, which is activating the prefrontal cortex so that then rather than just being driven by the amygdala, the alarm, the prefrontal cortex is actually stepping back in, okay? And we begin by focusing, which we do with a, a nice, simple maneuver we call SOS, since that's familiar even to the younger generation. Mostly they've heard of that, even though they don't know it means save our ships. Here what it means is, and think about this, I bet this is what you do when you're facing a challenge or when you're stressed, at your best, when you're not just reacting. And again, not because of trauma, but just because this is how our bodies handle stress. I guess I would imagine that the first thing you do is you say to yourself, OK, wait, just slow down. Don't say anything. Don't rush. Wait just long enough to figure out what's going on here before you Tap out that email that you wish you hadn't sent or that text that and you go, oh, no, why did I send that? Okay, so all those times where you go, no, wait, 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 wait. Stop, slow down, and just clear your mind. And then you focus on something. And probably at your best, what you focus on is something that really expresses what's important to you at that moment in your life. It may be something about a relationship. It may be something or someone who gives you hope. It may be someone or something that you know has got your back and will protect you or care for you. It might be something you know about yourself and your resilience, your, your ability to think clearly even under stress. And that orienting thought, the O, is really the key. That's what begins the reset of the brain. It seems so simple, but the art of this is to find exactly the right orienting thought at any given moment for each of us as individuals. And that's what's so individual. There is no single mantra. This is not prepackaged. This comes from each of us, each child. But that thought is whatever you need at that moment in order to realize that you can handle this and there is something that you can do that will make a difference in this situation, even if you're encountering an enormous stressor. And when you have that thought, even for a moment, you can feel the change in your body. 
and just feel. It's not a relaxation exercise. Sometimes when we teach this, people think, okay, let's do an SOS, so we'll just close our eyes and slow down and think this really nice thought, and I'll go to a desert island and turn and no cell phone reception and just be completely relaxed and the sound of the waves. That's okay. That's one way this can be done. But the best way to do this for us as healthcare providers currently or in training and social services and family services providers and for our clients and, and patients, the best way to do this is to focus on what do I need to know right now so that I am living and acting in accord with my core values and with who I am as a person. And that might seem a little highfalutin, but it's amazing to me how kids get this. And of course, that, that kind of taps into the adolescent search for values and ethics and morals and what's right and what's wrong, which is a great thing, but oftentimes they're too busy surviving. This is a way of coming back to the, the core, one of the core agendas of latency age, childhood, and adolescence, which is figuring out what you believe in and who you are based on what you stand for and how you live. This can be drawn on in that quick a time. This is not something where you have to spend hours on this. But how many times do you have to repeat this before your prefrontal cortex is starting to send a really good, strong message to your amygdala of, hey, chill, or calm, it's okay. We don't know how many times, but it's probably thousands. Okay, and that's what we teach, that this is not something that you do because we call it an SOS, it's something that you, that you do to tap into the power that you have of your brain, through your resilient brain, which can signal to your intensely survival-oriented brain, which is keeping you alive and protecting you, I've got this handled. And at that point, you're probably thinking much more clearly, even if you're under high stress. And the second S is just simply a self-check. Just basically how much stress are you feeling on a scale from one to 10? It helps sometimes for people just to be, I'm a seven right now. I, I'm not gonna tell you everything that I'm feeling. I'm not really, but sometimes a number is easier than trying to describe what's going on in your life and what stress do you have. I'm a seven right now on the stress scale. But also how much personal control do you have? And we define personal control, you may accept this or not, as the ability to think clearly under stress. That's simple. And I have yet to find even a teenager who would not at least reluctantly agree that that makes sense, often reluctantly. But the ability to think clearly under stress, what do great athletes do, what do great musicians do, what do famous people do, what do our role models do in all walks of life that makes them so highly effective and people we can look up to, it's they, they're the people who are able to maintain their perspective and think clearly under stress. And that's why we can trust them and that's why we can rely on them not to make things worse most of the time, except when their alarm takes over their brains too. So this is basically the skill that is at the core of handling stress for all of us. And we teach this as a way for healthcare providers in training as well as in practice to use this not just for your patients but for yourself. But use it in whatever way makes sense to you. It's not a formula, it's a framework. It's a way of understanding how to actually have control in the face of very powerful forces in our brains that will otherwise hijack. And the rest of the, the, the freedom steps are basically just being able to, in, in advance, anticipate triggers. So we're all familiar with that. But the importance there is not having a list of, oh, this is what gets me really upset and this is, and this is what really bothers me. It's that when people develop a list of triggers, then they begin to see that, of course, my reactions make sense because that's a trigger that reminds me of this past situation, even if it's not a horrible thing. So of course my brain is going into an alarm mode. Makes sense. Trigger identification then is a way of helping people to recognize that their reactions make sense, even if they seem extreme. 
And sometimes triggers are as simple as species-specific triggers, as Snoopy experienced right here. Just a feline trigger, <laughs> okay? And then the last part that I'll tell you is where we go from that and the rest of the freedom steps is just basically doing the same thing that we do with the SOS, but we do it with emotions and then with thoughts or cognitions. And then we do it with goals. And then we do it with choices, behavioral options. And what we do is we help people to see how once you orient yourself to what is truly important, who you are as a person, what you value, what you believe in, it becomes possible to tap into emotions that give you a sense of hope, even though you may at the same time be, feel, be feeling really angry, discouraged, depressed. And the, the crucial point here is that even in the worst emotional moment, we all have the ability to access other emotions. They don't erase the unpleasant emotions. They don't replace the unpleasant emotions. They coexist and they're in the background. And if we can bring them forward just a little bit and realize, well, you know, I was just so angry that I, you know, I was yelling at that teacher and then she told me to get out and go down to the principal's office. Well, I don't know my emotions. I was angry. I was frustrated. What was I thinking? I was thinking, she's an awful person. How dare she do that? Well, what else was that young man thinking? And again, this is not something we would do in a simple way or very rapidly, but over time, well, clearly that same young man who yelled at his teacher and seemed so angry and, and just so vindictive, he was feeling a sense of loyalty to a friend who he felt had been disrespected. He was feeling a sense of protectiveness, friendship and caring. And when, when that first got brought out in the conversation, he's like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm a good friend, and yeah, I care about my friends, but right then I didn't care about that, anything. I just wanted to yell at that teacher. It takes some, it, some dialogue there, but even kids who are really deeply caught in survival mode recognize that a lot of what they're doing and a lot of what they're feeling is based upon something deeper. And you don't have to do five sessions a week for many, many years of psychoanalysis necessarily to get to some of those deeper emotions. You just have to know that they're there and have a little bit of help in recognizing that in addition to that anger, he was feeling a sense of caring, of protectiveness. In addition to thinking negative thoughts about that teacher, he was also thinking, I don't want my friend to be prevented from graduating because this teacher is putting him down and making him feel stupid. So a lot of thoughts that get lost in the shuffle, a lot of emotions that get lost in the shuffle. And as a result, then the goal looks like I just want revenge or I just want to react. But the goal actually is often a truly noble. And with trauma survivors, that's one of the most remarkable things I've found, that the goals that they have that are unstated often and unrecognized because others of us don't see them, but now maybe we can, those are goals that really have to do with making a contribution and not just with survival. And so that's where we, we go with our last step, that when you're able to focus and think clearly under stress, it doesn't solve all your problems. It doesn't replace having a great support system having really good health care, being able to access resources. Those are really important. But in addition to that, in doing all of that, if you can think clearly and you recognize that and others in your life see that you think very clearly, then you have the ability to pull yourself out of that trap of self-blame, self-loathing, self-criticism that so many trauma survivors fall in because they don't realize that it's not something wrong with them. It's something wrong that has happened to them. So I'll close with just a, a return example to that young man who had no goals. Well, it turns out that when we work through these steps, which I never told him because he wouldn't have liked it because these are not his steps, but they were my mental framework. So do keep that in mind. Sometimes people love to see this and they love to use this. And other times they just want to talk through situations and we can use this as a framework. I realized that as we talked over time, 
And gradually, he, he started to view me as not a complete idiot and, and not somebody who was going to do something else to make his life more miserable, which unfortunately he had to happen in his view by, from many providers with the best of intentions. He started to tell me a few things, and he, two things that he, that he showed me that I think kind of are a great way to draw this to a close and show you resilience in action. Again, a young man, multiple diagnoses, multiple out-of-home placements, multiple problems with juvenile justice and schools. And what he showed me was, number one, he said, you know, I used to play chess with this one therapist. It was pretty boring, so I, don't, I hope you don't have to play chess. And I went, okay, we don't have to play chess. Well, about 10 sessions later, he said, oh, I see you got a chess board up there. You want to play some chess? <laughs> I just put it up there, being very sly. <laughs> I had no idea, and if he never mentioned it, I wouldn't have brought it up. So, yeah, okay, fine. What did I learn? I learned that this is a young man. He beat the heck out of me at chess. I'm not good at it. But he did it because he could see three moves ahead. And that's what I learned by playing chess with him. I learned that he had the capacity to see several moves ahead. He had a great foresight. What, how was he applying that? To hypervigilance. How could he apply that? So many different ways. And then the other thing he showed me was, and again, this is one of those situations where you go, oh, I, I don't know, is this really happening? He, brought, he, he said, oh, I've got to show you this video I took on my, on my, on my phone. This is really a great video. And I'm thinking, uh-oh. <laughs> my alarm went off. And I did an SOS. Okay, what's important here is, is to see what is it that this young man wants to communicate to me. I also need to remember that he's going to try to lead me down the path a little bit and see if I'm going to react so that he can then say, oh, yeah, you don't get it. So I said, okay, stay calm. You can handle this. And then he said, it's a video of these two girls fighting, and they're beating the hell out of each other. It's so great. And, of course, then my alarm really went off, thinking, I can't watch this. This is terrible. Okay, long story short, I said, all right after I did an SOS or three or four of them, said, okay, here's the deal. I know you want me to see something here, and I'm, I'm willing to watch this, but I'm not watching this to see these two girls fighting because that's just not something I can really go along with. But I want to see your camera technique. Okay, so he showed me the film, and he had brilliant camera technique. He was like a little war correspondent. He was in there right up to the fight, and then he got underneath, and he really got right in the middle between them taking this film. <laughs> Seriously? And then, I kid you not, I couldn't make this up, he did an after-fight interview with each of the combatants. <laughs> He's like, whoa, she really wailed on you. Well, yeah, but I got her pretty good. <laughs> so he did, he did this amazing job. And, and I said to him, you know, it's very hard for me to watch this because I really, you know, I'm not really in favor of violence and I don't want to support that part of it. But I think what you're showing me is not... It's not the violence. It's that you have an ability. You know, have you ever thought about becoming a war correspondent? It's dangerous, and I don't necessarily recommend it, but you've got an amazing ability to see things and to position yourself. And he said, oh, yeah, and all the kids leave me alone. They know that, you know, I'm not going to do anything, so that's how I can get right up in there. He said, you know, you have some remarkable abilities that could translate into some incredible kinds of work and jobs and success as an adult. I know you don't have goals. I know you're not interested in that. But I just wanted to say that. And, and he kind of looked at me like, okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. To me, that's the work that we're doing. We're talking with people. It's not always that dramatic. But we're talking with people where if we can see their strengths, if we can see their ability to think clearly under stress, then we don't have to teach them how. We just need to show them how they're using these steps. These belong to them. This is what they have based on their core values, their beliefs, their loyalties, the attachments that give them a sense of security, even if you're a marriage therapist for your foster parents, the sense of some kind of inner peace and calm, even though that's often hard to access, and just the fact that this is what's most important. This is who I am. This is what my life is about. This is who I am at my best. And to be able to be a mirror, and that's what we all are, 
to reflect that to a trauma survivor, not to say, oh, you're a good person, or I know you're very resilient because you've had trauma, but to say, I see these remarkable abilities that you have, and I hear how you are able to think clearly under situations that I don't know if I could. That is worth its weight in gold. And if you do that with this mental image in your mind of, this is your thinking center talking to that trauma survivor's thinking center and making a connection so that they see that there's somebody else in the world who recognizes that they've got something up here. And it's not IQ. It's the ability to be incredibly resilient. And it's also an ability to potentially have the kind of life that they want and to be able to make a contribution. And that's, for me, what all of us and all of our work is about. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julian. Don't retreat. Come back up here. I think 20 years ago, you and I had a discussion. I remember it well. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. That the tendency among many therapists, when they encounter people who have experienced trauma, is to uncover. And we debated that, mm -hmm. that that may not be the best thing for people who have experienced trauma. And, and why would be, that be the case? I mean, your psychoeducational model that you've laid out today for this audience of Target does not do that. Correct. Do you want to comment on that for a moment? Sure. I, I'd be glad to. And that, that's a really good point that Dr. Hugh is raising. If you, if you are a, a student or a scholar of evidence-based treatments for post-traumatic stress disorder, which I hope you're not, um, but if you are, you know that the, the interventions, the therapeutic interventions that have the strongest evidence base, usually delivered in approximately 10 to 12 sessions, which is way too few for a real world, to be quite honest. But okay, I've done it too. Some of my studies are, in, are that brief as well. That those interventions that are best evidence-based involve having people intentionally go back and dredge up a trauma memory or more than one or a part of it and focus very intensely on that. Now, that can be enormously helpful if a person is scared of those memories or feels that they, they can't allow themselves to think of them because it breaks the cycle of avoidance and intrusion. So I would be the last person to say that it's not potentially beneficial. But the reason why we developed Target, and there are some other interventions that do similar things, without dredging up the memories, is because every time that you process a stressful life experience today, in the way that I just, just, just described with the SOS, with the freedom steps, you're really working through a trauma memory, if that's part of your experience. But you don't have to go back to that memory. You are experiencing some of the same stress and survival reactions right in the moment. And that's what we teach, that it's not that trauma memories are unimportant, they're extremely important, but they are a marker of what your brain has captured from that experience to protect you. And that's why they keep coming back, and you don't have to get rid of them. In fact, you can't. Memories are indelible. You can't get rid of them, and you don't have to try to get rid of them. But what you can do is you can figure out how to react and manage and think clearly and focus on what's important to you when they come back up in your life now. And I have to admit that I just got today, uh, coincidentally, today online there is an article written by somebody by my name that is on this basically unpacking trauma memory processing. So I went back thinking about how important this is and said, I don't want to be the, the, known as the guy who dissed trauma memory processing and said, you know, don't ever make those people uncover or unpack. No, I want to be known as somebody who says, what's happening when you unpack those memories? And are there ways of doing that that don't involve sitting down and dredging up all that stuff right now that involve living your life and making connections? And so I'm, I'm really rather pleased with that article because it basically 
all the people in my field are going to be angry about it because they're going to be saying, well, wait a minute, he's saying it's okay, but it's not, or you can do it this way, but it's only our way. The whole point is people can go back and rework trauma memories in many, many ways. It's not just by going back and telling the story, even though sometimes that is a good way to do it. There are many ways to rework trauma memories. So we weren't really debating. We were more saying, you know, there's got to be more than one way to skin this cat, and there is. And what we've just talked about is trauma memory processing. It just isn't dredging up trauma memories. It's processing trauma reactions in your current life and understanding how that's just a variation on handling stress. And therefore, that is something that we as providers and students and advocates, we're all doing that all the time. If we know that, then we know we're in the same boat with our clients and our patients. It's not them and us. We're all doing the same thing. We just have different life experiences. And there are different ways to figure out what those life experiences have taught us, what they mean, and how best to continue on resiliently. As that young man was showing us, there are many ways. Thank you. We're going to take a break now and uh, return at uh, 2.45. So um, I'm Denny Doggart. I'm a physician. I work at the medical school. I am part of the planning committee. Um, I would like just to do two or three very brief housekeeping items. Uh, in your folders, there are cards, index cards, if you'd like to write questions for the panel. Uh, at the end of Dr. Keeshan's, we're going to have a, a, a panel that comes up, and we're going to ask them some of the questions. Um, and if you could pass those, we have some medical students, these two brilliant, smiling, smart young ladies in their white coats will be walking up and down the aisle. Uh, right before we start Dr. Keishan, and then uh, right before we start the panel, if you have any questions regarding his uh, talk also. And then if you could please complete the pre and post assessment, that would be very, very helpful to those of us who have planned this, uh, this experience. And lastly, uh, there will be more cheese and uh, drinks and uh, desserts after this if you want to hang around and meet and mingle with the panel. Thank you. And because my memory is so short, I forgot to uh, uh, announce at the beginning of this, and I don't know whether it would be valid now to do it or not, but there's a pre-survey um, <laughs> that people are supposed to, uh, we've asked for people to complete. I asked Katie Nealon, the, the medical student's going to be on the panel, to kind of uh, shoot me spit, spitballs to get my attention, but she didn't have any paper, she said. So um, it's still okay? Okay. So now I, w I want to introduce uh, Brooks Keeshan. And, and Brooks, I don't know whether you can hear me or not at this point. I can hear you. You can hear me. Uh, are you yes. back in Salt Lake City now? I am. You are. OK. And, yeah. and were you traumatized in, in uh, <laughs> leaving Detroit to go back to Salt Lake? I've had some opportunity to do some processing. And <laughs> um, I think I'm good to go. So thank you. OK. And we'll pay for your hotel room. I just want you to know that. It's okay. So Brooks Keeshan, I, I met um, in December in Hong Kong. We were <clears throat> at a meeting. And he is, I would characterize as, uh, as one of the rising stars in uh, American psychiatry and in the trauma field. He's triple boarded um, in adult psychiatry, child psychiatry, and pediatrics, and is, has been a fellow in uh, pediatric child abuse, which I think he completed in 2013-2014. Uh, he did his undergraduate work at, at Xavier, and then uh, um, went to the uh, University of Cincinnati Medical School, and then did his residency at the University of Utah, which is where he is based now. And by the way, Brooks, I spoke to somebody in Charleston yesterday who said they were trying to recruit you to Tulane at one point. You may know the person I'm referring to, uh, but, but they didn't win out. So she still has hopes. Uh, she, she's at Tulsa now, so she has hopes that uh, she could attract your attention for, to that particular medical school. 
Uh, I know exactly uh, whom you're referring to. Okay. Oh. Of course, we have our own designs here, um, <laughs> but, uh, but I'm not going to be explicit about those. But Brooks is, is also part of this National Childhood Stress uh, Network. He has a, he's a principal investigator on, on his center. Uh, and as a, a, a pediatrician, um, his talk today is going to be on a primary approach to pediatric trauma, screening, diagnostic, and treatment considerations. So um, I'm assuming that you, you are well rested, you slept well on your flight back to Salt Lake, and uh, you can have a go at this. Thank you for joining us today, uh, Brooks. Thank you so much. Uh, it, it's great to be with you all electronically. I wish I could be there in person. Um, and just, just from a timekeeping standpoint, since no one can wave their hands at me, um, I currently have about three minutes till the hour um, how long do I have until we need to stop? An hour? An hour? Forty-five minutes. Forty-five minutes. Okay. So, so I will. I will aim to end right at a quarter till. Um, and please, someone text me if I start to be the typical psychiatrist and keep droning on and on. Um, but I. But I wanted to start off with something that I experienced yesterday which was sitting on the runway in Detroit. Um, we had just de-iced the plane. And after de-icing the plane, uh, we went to take off. And we're sitting on the runway and we're taking off. We're, we're about to take off to go to Scranton. And I think we're next in line. And the pilot goes over the overhead and says, I'm sorry, but our flight has been canceled. And I would imagine that if this happened to any of you, um, you would probably have some feelings of, ah, oh, oh, I can't believe it, all this, oh, and, and everyone starts to go on their phones and do that, and that's exactly the response I had. Oh, my gosh. Oh, what a what a inconvenience to me. Um, and, and, I, and as I had the opportunity to think on my uh, three-and-a-half-hour flight back from Detroit to Salt Lake last night about my experience, uh, something really uh, occurred to me in a very concrete way that I hadn't fully appreciated in the past, um, which is how important it is for all of us to always be engaged in trauma prevention and early detection. Even though it isn't sexy, even though it isn't the cool, cool thing like, I mean, you got to hear Julian talk about Target, and, you know, we're doing some really neat things with our... Uh, primary uh, early intervention uh, trauma screening, you know, and it's all about this kind of doing the cool service and treating PTSD, eradicating uh, complex trauma. But really, the, the real work, the main body of work needs to be in prevention. And my reaction to the pilot is what most people do. Ah, oh, I can't believe it. When in reality, what was he doing? He was preventing a potential trauma. Um, so it's, it's a thankless task, and I think I think it's important. So you know, as we're thinking about a broader healthcare system and how primary care interacts with mental health care, and how we make all these systems work together, we have to recognize that whether we're primary care and we're the front lines for prevention, and making sure that our families know that this is a place where we can talk about traumatic experiences, uh, so that we can do something quickly, or whether we're in the tertiary mental health settings and we're seeing the most uh, impacted children from complex trauma, recognizing that those two are individuals at high risk of subsequent trauma, and how are we engaging them in prevention activity? Um, so it was just a little aha moment uh, that occurred to me that I just wanted to share with you all. But, um, and I would say this is very strange not being able to see you all. I'd love to be able to um, have a more uh, personal interaction, but, but I think we can move forward. So um, these are my disclosures. Is the disclosure slide now up? Yeah. Are we on a, is there a time delay or we're good? Okay. Yes? Yes. Great. So, so I have uh, the funding through SAMHSA, uh, similar to Julian, but uh, just not as much as Julian. Um, and then uh, we also receive funding from the HR Department of Health as well as uh, funding uh, for some consultation work 
uh, at Uppsala University in um, Uppsala, Sweden. And I have up-to-date royalties. So um, what I'd like to do is, over the next 45 minutes, uh, give you my take uh, and what we've been thinking about when it comes to um, utilizing some of the best minds in the trauma world and trying to apply that within a primary care, frontline, or early intervention setting when addressing childhood trauma. And we're going to kind of break our discussion down into these three areas. The first one being course. And when we think about time course, you know, clearly we have to start with this idea that, well, we understand that there's a post-trauma experience, and, and that's not just traumatic stress symptoms, as you can see at the bottom of the slide there. Um, and this is kind of playing off of some of the stuff that Julian talked about earlier. But it's also important to think about the fact that trauma begets trauma. And people who have traumatic experiences can have other traumas and adversities. It's also the fact that trauma begets suicidality. That if we have a discussion about trauma, we're not talking about suicidality. Um, we're probably doing a disservice uh, to our families. Um, and we're probably kind of putting our heads in the sand. And, and not engaging them when it comes to some of the issues that might be most critically urgent for them, which is thoughts about wishing they were dead or wanting to hurt themselves. But of course, we do need to think about the classic traumatic stress symptoms as well. And we need to do this, and you can see how heterogeneous this is, intrusive symptoms, you know, thinking about the event or feeling like it's happening all over again, avoiding symptoms, not wanting to talk or think about it, or see people or places that remind you of it. These negative thoughts, you know, the world is a dangerous place. Why does this stuff always happen to me? I don't feel connected to my fellow person. Or the hyperarousal, you know, I'm looking out for the next danger. I can't fall asleep. I am more irritable than normal. And of course, that kind of coming in and out of our normal conscious state to a more removed state from dissociation. So it is to lay the groundwork that this is already at its core a little tricky. You got different adversities, suicidality, and this heterogeneous mix of all of these different types of traumatic stress responses. But we have to overlay that with the fact that when we have a definable event, there's actually a natural con time course that we have to understand. And that time course can be different for every kid, every adolescent, even every adult that we see. And this is adapted from some of Chris Lane's work, um, so I want to give him full credit. But if you look at the x-axis, we're looking at kind of pre-trauma in the middle of peri-trauma or when the trauma occurred, and then post-trauma. And then on the y-axis is just generally speaking, am I doing good? That's at the top. Or am I doing not good? That's at the bottom. So in some cases, like resistance, which is a real thing, you can be doing well and then something happens, and there's really no appreciable change in functional functionality. And so you just kind of keep going about your day. And, and I raise that because I think it's important because that is actually inherently different than resilience, which we in the pediatric world love to talk about. But resilience doesn't mean that it doesn't impact you. In fact, by definition, resilience means that it does impact you, that there is a demonstrable change. However, because of the supportive family, because of kind of some inner qualities that we may not understand, because of whatever series of circumstances, that individual can bounce back relatively quickly to their normal pre-trauma good functioning state. But a very important distinction to make, because what we're probably dealing with is not resistance. We're dealing with, at best, resilience. But unfortunately, not all people have that path. Some people will have a decline where they're going along, and this is the orange color that's at the top of your screen, and then maybe not even at the time of the trauma, but sometime after the trauma, there'll be an appreciable decline in functioning and the establishment of a new baseline, which is much lower. Uh, and folks may not make the connection that this change in functioning has anything to do with the trauma. Or you could have individuals with a protracted recovery where people understand that the decline in functioning is trauma-related, but they establish a new baseline, but with intervention. And that could either be the family's intervention or a clinical therapeutic intervention, there is a slow return back to prior levels of functioning. You can have severe persisting distress where everyone knows this is related to the trauma, 
and maybe you even get a little bit of help, but you actually don't get back up to baseline. And, and unfortunately, we do see this quite often with families that they're able to seek help when they're in crisis, but once the crisis starts to abet a little bit, even though they haven't gotten back to where they were before, they drop out and a new baseline, which is not at the same level as the prior baseline, is established. And of course, there is the post-traumatic growth, and I'm still wanting to know what the secret sauce is to create post-traumatic growth. But this is this idea that after the trauma, through whatever occurs, a new baseline to status of functionality is actually higher than their prior level. And these are folks who give TED Talks. They're folks that, you know, are strong advocates. Um, they are, you know, remarkable people. And, um, you know, I'd love to know some of uh, Julian and Layton's thoughts as to, you know, how we get this. Um, but I, I just will have to admit myself that when I am privileged enough to see someone experiencing this, I just like to, to hang on for the ride and, and just watch it occur. But I, I show on the sorry, the last thing, the stable maladaptive functioning is very similar to resistance in that uh, with stable maladaptive functioning, after traumatic events, there's no appreciable change. They're still at their pretty crummy level of functioning. And afterward, they stay at their pretty crummy level of functioning. Kind of almost like a floor effect, like they were doing so poorly that even this other trauma occurred, it really didn't change how they were doing much at all. So as you can see, we all know that if you're thinking about traumatic stress and trauma, uh, PTSD, there is a definable traumatic event. However, uh, it's important to recognize that, um, you know, there's a couple of different pathways we have to consider, you know, just a few. And you add that on top of what I mentioned earlier, that trauma begets trauma. And so now you have traumatic events overlaying on responses to traumatic events. And then, oh, by the way, adversity also lays on to trauma. So you have all these kind of smaller traumatic events or significant adversity events. Trying to put this picture together, uh, it starts to become a little challenging. And, and that's why I think having a plan in place, having a very structured, systematic response, which is what we've been working on, starts to help us kind of tease some of this stuff out when we don't have the resources and the time uh, in the pre-complex trauma kiddos to try to tease everything out. But I do want, before we get into what we can do about these kids, um, if I haven't already convinced you that thinking about the symptoms and the symptom course is challenging, I do want to spend just a minute talking about exposures. Counting traumas, I think, is pretty simple. One, two, three, four, five. Defining traumas, however, is not so simple. If you go to the CDC and you're talking about definitions of child abuse, people could say things like words or overt actions that cause harm, potential harm, or threat of harm to a child. Or the World Health Organization, things that resulting in actual or potential harm. But there's a problem with this. And that problem is, is that harm is not objectively reported. There is a level of interpretation that's required, even for us all on to be on the same page, as to what harm is. And as Layden mentioned, I am a child abuse pediatrician. I did a three-year fellowship to try to figure out how to even define what child abuse is. It is not always so simple. If we think about sexual abuse, the same challenges occur. Sexual abuse, this is the AAP guidance. Sexual abuse occurs when a child is engaged in sexual activities that the child cannot comprehend, or the child's adolescent is developmentally unprepared and cannot consent for, or in the violate the laws or taboos of society. But, but let me just highlight one little piece of that, and cannot consent for. Now, you know, I'm not there with you all in Pennsylvania, but I would guess that the laws in Utah are slightly different than the laws in Pennsylvania. And in fact, when you think about just defining what is the age of consent, and, and just, just for record, this is also something that I, a wiki page, so I'm not actually saying that all of these are exactly correct. The point is just to show how much heterogeneity we have, both within the United States and then outside of the United States, when thinking about other cultures, as to what the age of consent would be. 
So moving past the idea of forced sexual contact, but but rather when can individuals um, uh, be uh, can can participate in the consent of sexual contact? Uh, we have a really hard time defining even with sexual abuses beyond the the forced uh, aspect of it. And this is from Elizabeth Gershoff's uh, work that she's done. She's really a, a thought leader when it comes to the effects of discipline and was one of the main driving forces to the most uh, Bob Segge's uh, recently published AAP report on clinical punish, uh, uh, corporal punishment. But, but I take this out of her report to highlight again that even when we're trying to thoughtfully determine what's the difference between corporal punishment and physical abuse, we really struggle. Um, you know, these ideas like, uh, you know, for, for me when I was in Ohio, which is where I did most of my uh, child abuse training, the difference between corporal punishment and physical abuse is when it is unreasonable and or excessive, as if that is the clearest cut thing that you can think about. So we haven't even really talked about what those traumatic reactions are. We've talked about kind of from a functional standpoint whether those symptoms impair us or not. And we've talked about the experience in terms of being hard to define, but, but we haven't even gotten to the reactions themselves. And that really is where our work is done. And so I do want to take a step back to talk a little bit about our project and our center. And we, just like Julian, are part of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. Uh, for those of you who don't know where Utah is, we're um, uh, two states uh, east of California. And that's our little flag right there indicating our center. We're part of a broader network, and we have been uh, tasked with the idea of how do we assist frontline pediatric and other frontline providers to better detect, assess, and implement the next first steps, the right first steps when it comes to children at risk for traumatic stress. We can't do this by ourselves. Uh, this is truly, truly a statewide effort that has uh, both the largest healthcare system, Intermountain Healthcare, the second largest healthcare system, University of Utah, uh, and also uh, some of the largest funders of treatment for children uh, who have been traumatized. Specifically, Select Health Insurance at the bottom of the screen, which is the largest insurer in the state of Utah, and uh, the Utah Office for Victims of Crime, which is effectively the second largest payer behind Select Health when it comes to paying for the treatment of traumatized uh, youth in our state. We also have a number of uh, wonderful collaborations on the right side uh, of the screen as well. And our task is to develop a care process model. And you know, I think lots of healthcare systems have similar products, uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page. A care process model is a decision support tool or algorithm that helps uh, providers follow standards and best practices. It, it, it is based on the assumption, um, which has been scientifically proven, that if you improve efficiency, you increase accuracy, and you decrease variation, that leads to increased quality. And when we're talking about a care process model for pediatric traumatic stress, that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're identifying the fact that traumatized kids come through primary care pediatric uh, settings all the time, and there's uh, very inefficient processes on how to detect them. There is uh, not always the most accurate methods for trying to identify who they are, and the variation by what these kids get is phenomenal. And so our goal is to try to streamline those things, which if we are able to effectively do that, should improve the quality of the care that these kids receive. This is an example of our roadmap. And I'm going to go into a little bit of detail on this in about uh, five or six slides, but it, but it lays the groundwork with what we're hoping to achieve, which is a very predictable, easy to follow plan that a non-trauma expert can apply to a child where they're concerned about traumatic stress. And it really essentially comes down to three fundamental things that all providers need to be able to do, and a first optional thing that a lot of providers like to do, but it isn't required of every single provider. Those three fundamental things are um, treating trauma as easy as one, two, three. One being report 
if there is a requirement to report because you're concerned about the child's safety. Two, determine if there is any risk for suicidality within this child. And then three, assess for whether or not this child needs further trauma assessment and treatment. And, and when we come back to the forms, and I run through it a number of times, I think you'll see a little bit more of what I'm saying. But what I want to do before I get there is help try to make the argument why we need to focus on traumatic stress. So traumatic stress, um, as opposed to thinking about toxic stress, which is very popular in the pediatric vernacular, it's directly related to things that we do know how to treat. It's directly related to DSM diagnoses, not just the acute stress disorders and post-traumatic stress disorders and the adjustment disorders, but it is also associated with other things that we commonly see in pediatrics, such as depression, anxiety, and ADHD. And a framework can help identify what do we do now, what do we do next, and what do we need to follow. But we have to put it in within the framework that we apply to all other healthcare systems. Because the challenge, and I, and I think conceptually, toxic stress is great. I think it helps folks understand that chronic exposure to adversity uh, impacts our, not just the way that we think about the world, but the way that our body works. But I would argue that until we have a Band-Aid for some of those brain stressors, and until we have Band-Aids for how the other end organs react to that uh, persistent path of, you know, uh, HPA access, uh, disruption, and dysenergy with the sympathetic nervous system and the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, until we actually have those Band-Aids, we actually need to figure out, well, what are things that we can treat? And how do we most effectively and efficiently get those kids into that type of treatment mechanism? This is consistent with ACAP uh, prior reports on PTSD, as well as AAP and CEC information that's out there. It's consistent with ACEs screening, although it's different than ACEs screening. And, and I do want to let folks know that after three long, hard years, we do have an AAP clinical report on the evidence-based assessment and treatment of maltreated youth coming sometime, hopefully soon in 2019, that also helps primary care uh, reemphasize what can their role be uh, and how can they most effectively detangle some of these things that we've developed a care process model to help do for them. But before one starts to think about introdu introducing yet another thing that we're going to try to do within a primary care or frontline setting, we do have to think about, well, can this work? Are there things from a flow standpoint, from a population standpoint, what do we need to problem solve beforehand? And one of them, of course, is rate of exposure. And I will tell you, we are, we are currently doing this in both primary care settings, uh, which have, um, uh, you know, kind of your typical suburban population. And we're doing this in, in children's advocacy centers, where children go after they've disclosed sexual abuse or other types of child abuse. And, you know, almost all of the kids there uh, have some type of potentially traumatic exposure. Uh, and for both low prevalence settings and high prevalence settings, there are things that one has to consider. And one of them is cert certainly the question, the utility of screening. You know, like we get providers all the time say, why do I have to do 100 screens just to find one kid? Um, or in a high prevalence setting, well, aren't they all just traumatized? Um, other things are like, well, we already give families so many questionnaires. Why can we, how can we justify giving them one more? Or, well, yeah, we could give the family the questionnaire, but they've got a trauma brain going on. They're in crisis mode, and they're not going to be able to answer any questions in a meaningful way. We also get the idea that, well, this isn't really what they expect when they come for a sprained ankle, um, and so we don't want to offend families. Um, and, and frankly, um, you know, from the high problem settings, oftentimes we get this, well, you know, it's not going to impact what we do because we don't have any trauma treatment providers. Like, why should we even go through this process? Um, but, but clearly there's need that if you're going to develop a system, a process, it has to be agile enough that can actually effectively work in both low prevalence and high prevalence uh, settings because these are reasonable issues that providers are bringing up. The other question comes up, like, do we want to spend our time on screening in more of the preventive and early intervention, 
or do we want to think about case finding? Do we only want to be using a systematic approach when we know that something is going on, and now we just want to know uh, whether or not it's trauma or not? And you can see on the screen here, there's pros and cons to both of that. You know, symptoms may not be detected clinically, which is a good reason for screening. And positive screens lead to clinical intervention. Those are some of the public health hallmarks for why you would do screening. But also, there is good examples for why you should do case finding, not the least of which is medication. Um, because if we think about a child coming because of distress, and the chief complaint might be depression, um, there are uh, specific intervention therapies that one might go down a pathway for if they think about it in the depression pathway versus uh, the PTSD pathway. And the depression pathway may confer this idea of a medication where the PTSD or trauma therapy might not. Um, so a lot of different things to consider when trying to fit another, yet yes, another pathway into a very busy, already um, uh, way too much things to do uh, type of uh, clinical experience. Um, just so you don't have to take my word for it, this is actually right from uh, the uh, clinical report uh, that is uh, going at, undergoing its lost review. Just to highlight, again, some of these overlaps, these syndromic overlaps that we can see in pediatric traumatic stress and, say, depression. So the negative cognition and mood symptoms, negative belief toward self, self-blame, negative emotional state, loss of interest, detachment, you come to me with some of those symptoms, it would be perfectly logical for me to think about depression. And if I didn't know that something bad had happened, I might never think about PTSD. Hyperarousal and increased reactivity, the exact same thing. Irritability and anger. I mean, irritability is often considered the hallmark of pediatric PTSD, when oftentimes it's actually a hallmark of pediatric depression, when oftentimes it's actually more the hallmark of pediatric PTSD. Anxiety is the same way. Panic attacks, if you go, if you dig back into your DSM-5, or if you are like me and still have a DSM-4 on your shelf as well, um, panic attacks are not panic attacks when uh, the reason for the panic attack is a trauma reminder. But I will tell you, as a clinician who only sees tra potentially traumatized kiddos, I have yet to have anyone ever come to my clinic and say, Doc, you know, I'm having physiologic responses to trauma reminders. Not one. Now, now maybe in Scranton they would, but, but what they tell me here in Salt Lake is, I, my daughter's having a panic attack. We, you need to do something about it. Um, separation anxiety it could be separation anxiety, but if the reason why the child doesn't want to separate is because it it reminds them of their traumatic experience, or it makes them feel more vulnerable and in increased hyperarousal that's related to their trauma, maybe we're not talking about separation anxiety. Generalized and social anxiety oftentimes can be a little easier to differentiate, but even that can be difficult, especially with social anxiety, if we're talking about traumas related to bullying. And maybe the reason why we're called having performance issues uh, and inner different difficulties socializing with peers is related specifically to trauma reminders. And of course, traumatic stress and ADHD. This is, in my mind, one of the most humbling aspects of all of psychiatry, um, where I truly do not know how to tease out ADHD from traumatic stress when both are present. I really don't. And so what we do in our clinic is we really do actually think about, let's do a staged approach. Let's think about doing evidence-based trauma treatment, and then I promise I will reassess this kid at the end, and we can see if there really is ADHD there. Because even when you think about a temporal approach, and you think about how, well, maybe, um, you know, if the ADHD symptoms were present before the traumatic experience happened, that helps really identify. And sometimes it does. But, but more often, what ends up happening is you uncover what some of those earlier childhood traumatic experiences were, and then you're still left in the same place of, is this a... Is this a hyperactive kid or a hyperaroused kid? So if it is trauma, what do we do? And you know, I, I'm going to 
fly through this because I think, you know, with Julian talking about Target, I think there's a lot of core concepts that we really don't want, and I unfortunately don't have the time to, to go over again. But, but just to reiterate, trauma-focused psychotherapy are the first-line treatment for children and adolescents with traumatic stress and PTSD. And similar uh, to Target, there are a number of evidence-based trauma therapies. And I tend to use trauma-focused CBT uh, because that's what we offer in our clinic as kind of the conceptual framework to demonstrate what are some of the core concepts found in many of the uh, trauma treatment therapies. Um, when you think about those first couple of things on the slide, the psychoeducation, relaxation, affective expression, and cognitive coping, uh, those are often referred to as the PRAC skills. And really, you're preparing the child for success, and you're giving the child some skills that can cope with distress. That's what that first section is. And then when you move down the practice mnemonic for trauma-focused CBT, there is a need, and this is a fundamental, we've known this for a long time, that there has to be some level of exposure to the trauma as well as some processing that needs to occur to correct cognitive distortions. And that's what, in TSCBT, the trauma narrative facilitates, not just the child writing about their experience in a safe environment, but also the therapist now being able to see some of those clear cognitive distortions that perpetuate some of the child's traumatic stress symptoms. And then lastly, and truly critical to any evidence-based trauma treatment, we want to reestablish safety and reestablish stability. And by safety, I mean making sure that these children who are at high risk for having other bad things happen to them are prepared to go out into a world that could be a little difficult. And we reconnect the child with the parent and reconnect that parent back into that role of being the child's emotional thermometer, behavioral meter, re-maintaining that parent-child relationship. Because the goal of evidence-based trauma treatment is, is that it ends. And, and we're not looking to establish these kind of childhood-long therapist-family uh, 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 connections. When it comes to medications, and I know a number of you are either in your training uh, to become prescribers or are prescribers, I do want to highlight just very quickly how important it is uh, in thinking about uh, meds. And, and this is a slide I've constructed based on data from several studies, including a wonderful uh, meta-analysis uh, that Marina did in 2016, but also including um, Adelaide Robb and Judy Cohen's research, which are really the only two um, uh, randomized controlled trials in children looking at the use of antidepressants uh, in PTSD. And what I've highlighted here is that uh, for uh, effect sizes, in which case uh, effect size of generally 0.4 to 0.6 is a moderate effect size, and an effect size of 0.7 or higher is a large effect size. Uh, that means that you've done a really good job. You've improved them quite a bit compared to what they were. You can see here that if you use combination therapy, which is trauma-focused therapy and sertraline, um, they actually go in the wrong direction. They don't get better. And, and the study was underpowered, but had they kept going on with the study, they might have actually demonstrated these kids actually did a little worse. And then Adelaide Robb's study, where she didn't use trauma-focused CBT, but did use sertraline, demonstrated that in kids who, uh, again, with sertraline versus uh, non-sertraline, the placebo, um, those kids, uh, I think the effects or the, the p-value uh, ended up being like 0.06. So again, didn't reach statistical significance, but you sure would have rather, looking at the data, you sure would have rather been in the sugar pill group than in the sertraline group. And why I mention this is that that is fundamentally different than what I've been trained in and what I think most of us have been trained in when it comes to anxiety and depression. There's wonderful uh, studies in child psychiatry looking at anxiety and in general, when you think about the anxiety or depression, just looking at the top row, combination is better. Sertraline and CBT, generally speaking, that's always the answer on the board test. That's always the, the go-to. And we know that sertraline and paroxetine are FDA-approved for PTSD in adults, 
But the problem is that when you do those studies in kids, and we don't have enough of them, but the research that we do really suggests that it's not helpful, and it implies, it suggests that it might even not be in the best interest of that child. And that play becomes really fundamentally important at the onset to decide, are we looking at a kid who's had some bad things happen in their life and they suffer from chronic anxiety and depression, or as we used to say back in the day, anxious depression, um, or are we really picking up symptoms that are more or more consistently or more comprehensively described through a traumatic stress lens, in which case that would infer a different approach to treatment. Um, I'm going to be, for the sake of time, because I am running late, I am going to go through this real quickly just to say there are evidence-based early intervention therapies out there. So this is um, Steve Berkowitz, uh, uh, Stephen Marin's, uh, and Kerry Epstein's model on child and family traumatic stress intervention, uh, where they show that you can get good improvement if you catch kids early on utilizing mostly prac skills in enhanced family communication around symptoms. And certainly in our clinic, we do not put all kids into the TFCBT framework. There are kids where their suicidality is, is a major issue, and we use suicide and self-injurious focused um, modalities like dialectal behavioral therapy to stabilize before doing the trauma. Or in little kids, who may have trauma symptoms but are behaviorally out of control, we will use parent-child interaction therapy first before engaging uh, the child in trauma treatment, if that still is necessary. And so what we do in our clinic, and this is kind of what led to, well, can we do this in a pediatric setting, is that if it's a recent trauma, we do try brief interventions if we can, recognizing that some kids will need more comprehensive treatment. If behaviors are more prominent than their trauma symptoms, we will try to utilize other evidence-based modalities that are not trauma-specific to address those behaviors first, enhance the stabilization of the child, and then look to see if there's any trauma symptoms remaining. And for those kids where their trauma symptoms are the most prominent feature, those are the ones where we really try to initiate evidence-based trauma treatment first. So this is what we do within the pediatric system in Intermountain Healthcare. In the care process model, which again is determining if the child needs to be reported because of concerns for safety, assessing for suicide risk, and assessing for need for trauma assessment and treatment. This is intended to get our clinicians so that they can make that decision. Where does this kid need to go? This is a copy of our tool. It is a paper or red cap a screener that can be filled out in the waiting room. Um, this is a parent report version, which you, we use from ages 5 to 10. And then we have a self-report version that's almost identical um, that we use for uh, youth ages 11 and up. But uh, just to orient you, at the top there are kind of a couple of open-ended trauma exposure questions, followed by um, 12 different trauma symptom questions. And then question number 13 is we're using the PHP-9 question 9, as our initial suicide screening question. So I'm going to go through this relatively quickly, and then maybe uh, as part of the you know, afterwards, we can we can answer or, or have a discussion about how some of these things work or other other pieces that might have come up. But I've kind of moved it up to the side there so you can see a little bit better, and hopefully the there won't be too much of a delay so you can kind of follow along. But but the way that we've trained our providers. To, to use this screen is that they start off, again, trauma is easy as one, two, three. So one and two are all about safety. The first one being is the child at risk of being hurt. The second one is the child at risk for hurting themselves. We train the clinicians, do not look in the middle until you've looked at the top and the bottom. And we do not pass go, we do not collect $200 until we've identified is this child physically safe and do we need to think about suicide. And in our system, similar to many other uh, healthcare systems around the country, we've adapted or modified uh, the Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale uh, that helps us, if there's a positive response, to determine is this a low, moderate, or high risk scale. And I have some data at the very end to show you how um, this has been incredibly helpful to our providers because part of the reason why they didn't want to ask about suicide 
And yet they always assume that if you ask and they say yes, they're going to be high risk. And the data doesn't support that. So assuming we've got them safe, that we don't need to report to child protection, and that they're not a risk for suicide, then we say to the provider, OK, now look in the middle. And when you look at the middle, um, there's only a couple of major gestalt things you need to think about. The first is, well, if the check marks are mostly to the left, then essentially it's a low-risk kid. So he might have had something potentially traumatic, but they're doing OK right now. And that either means that they were a resistant kid, a resilient kid, or that they're lying on, on the questionnaire, in which case hopefully the parent has given you the, the one, two with their eyes. Um, but you know, essentially, if you look at the check boxes, if you remember those timelines and figures and all that stuff I showed at the very beginning, these check boxes just tell you where they're at in all that panoply of different uh, timelines. If they happen to be more in the middle, so they're having some symptoms, sometimes it's a little bit of time, sometimes you know, a little bit more often. Well, this is a moderate risk kiddo. Uh, this kid might actually benefit from you know, a low touch intervention. They might a light touch intervention. They actually might benefit from if you have mental health integration, uh, a provider who can see kids a couple of times in the clinic. Um, just provide some skills and, and help the family. Um, but it could also be that if this child had a high risk traumatic exposure, say this was a kid who was sexually abused, um, and we know that sexual abuse is one of the uh, greatest risks uh, for ongoing uh, traumatic stress symptoms, then maybe we would do trauma treatment uh, with this child based on the fact that they're having maybe subclinical but, but impactful symptoms. And then if you look at the right and you think about, well, they're all, most of these check marks are on the right. Well, this is a high risk child. This child likely does currently have uh, PTSD or acute stress disorder. And this is the kind of kid that, you know, even if the family says things seem to be going OK, this is the kind of kid that still needs a trauma-informed eval. You know, I mean, you can have diabetes and have blood sugars in the 300s and the 400s and still think that things are going OK, that doesn't mean you don't need treatment. And this is the corollary for that. So kids still going to school, their grades are still Bs and Cs, I think we're making it, but they're having all these trauma symptoms. That's the same thing as an elevated glucose um, that just hasn't resulted in um, uh, diabetic ketoacidosis yet. Um, if uh, you have time, and this is that kind of step four piece that I said was optional, but actually a lot of providers have really liked doing. We've oriented the question so that the top two are, and I don't know if you can see my point or not, but that the top two are all about food. Because one of the quickest things that one can do in a primary care setting is address sleep. Or the first time you're meeting someone in a mental health setting is address sleep. And so we highlight that first, that if you're going to do anything that first time you see them, you do sleep first. If sleep is not that elevated, but then questions three through seven are elevated, that's the kids that are incredibly hyperaroused and they're having a lot of intrusive symptoms. So now we know not just where they are in their timeline, but we also know what's most impacting them right now. They're way up here. Sorry, I'm holding my hands, and you clearly can't see that I'm using my hands. They're way up, they're way up and we want to give them skills so they, they can bring themselves down a little bit. So we want to help them understand that and figure out how do they uh, cope with some of their symptoms. And then if their sleep's OK, if they're not way up high, but they're engaging in a lot of avoidance, and having a lot of negative cognition and mood, a lot of negative thoughts about the world, and a lot of negative feelings. Those are kids that are down here, that are low, that actually need some help coming up. These are the ones that might benefit from some behavioral activation. These are the ones that will benefit from some engagement when it comes to communication with their parents. We also provide identify a lot of resources that are uh, available through the National Child Traumatic Stress Network as well, along with the National Center for PTSD. And the important thing about any tool that you're going to use in a frontline setting is that it has to be the same tool that you use for initial 
as you use for any follow-up. And so you can do the same thing over and over and over again to see if what you've done with this family or if what the family has done for themselves or what the therapist is doing for the family is making a difference. A couple of minutes on what we've been currently doing in Utah, and then I'm going to wrap up. So this, again, is our state, and these are all the places where we've been uh, piloting our care process model, both in our advocacy centers, which are referred to as CJCs out here, or in primary care sites. And, and this is not a typo. That one that looks like it's out of the state is because it's in Evanston, Wyoming. Um, what we found is that in primary care settings, just using two open-ended trauma exposure questions, we are having response rates of anywhere from 18 to 25 of some type of either recent or past traumatic exposure. And in the primary care setting, approximately 10% of our kids who get screened, so this is not case finding, but screening, are positive for suicidal ideation. And it is the slim minority of those kids where they are in the high risk group. And so it is not destroyed clinic well. Of the kids that we're seeing, 8% of the children and 14% of the adolescents are either having moderate or significant trauma symptoms. And that tends to be evenly distributed between the two groups. Now, the same tool, same application in a, in a center that strictly evaluates kids with their concerns for sexual abuse, 40% of those adolescents have a positive uh, screen for suicidal ideation. 40%, four out of 10. But by using a standardized uh, suicide risk approach, only 3% uh, are actually going to the ED for crisis uh, referral, uh, for crisis evaluation and in inpatient management. And I will tell you, I have gotten so many emails from the directors at these centers saying, I feel sick to my stomach thinking how many kids have come to our center that we did not know were suicidal. And then lastly, thinking about the 46%, so effectively half of the kids who come to the CACs are in the high-risk group. Um, but that still is important because that also means that about half are not. And of that half that are not, some of them are doing pretty darn good. Um, so this idea that all kids need therapy or all kids need crisis-level intervention right away, when you actually screen them, they do actually differentiate into two separate groups. And this figure is here to show that, that if you're in a primary care setting and the uh, y-axis is basically a zero on the trauma symptom screener and 20, which is the difference between the yellow and the red, that's kind of high risk for PTSD, you see you have a handful of kids there um, that do either moderate or high risk. That's, that's what you'd expect, although it turns out that detecting those kids is often quite clinically meaningful. Versus at the CACs, there's about half that are uh, moderate to low risk for traumatic stress, and about half uh, that are high risk for traumatic stress. Still, it's, uh, enabling the establishment of a differentiated and informed response for those kids. And now in the last minute that I have, I do want to go through a couple of examples. These are real life examples of children. Um, the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Uh, but this is a kiddo who was in a motorcycle accident. and. Um, Doc didn't know about this. This is in a primary care setting. And when the parent filled out the symptom report for the, the child, um, you know, a couple of things with concentration and a little bit of irritability. Um, but otherwise, the symptom report was pretty mild. And, and this was reassuring to the family. And so what the doc ended up doing in this case was referring for community mental health because they were actually concerned about some of the concentration on an early long standpoint and maybe something's going on here, but it really didn't seem like there was a lot of trauma that was going on with this kiddo, and the family was reassured by that. Now, the reverse was true for this one. So this is a kid whose mom uh, had cancer, and unfortunately, that cancer had come back. And when she had cancer previously, she had had an episode where she almost died, and so this was very traumatizing this kiddo. Um, so when when they were in for a primary care checkup. This was not on the clinician's radar at all. Um, knew the mom was stressed, but wasn't thinking about trauma at all whatsoever. And the symptom screener enabled kind of this, oh, look, there really are some clear trauma symptoms that this child is experiencing. And, you know, wouldn't it be great for us to get this kid in for some evidence-based trauma treatment? Because we're not going to, I mean, mom's going to be undergoing treatment. Trauma reminders 
are consistently going to be present, how can we help support this child in an evidence-informed way? And then lastly, this is the last one when I'm, when I'm done. Um, this was one of my favorite ones that we've had so far, and, and one where we got a naysayer in a primary care setting to kind of come over to the other side. So we're doing uh, some of our uh, work we're doing in clinics where they had already adapted using uh, the PHQ uh, for screening for depression. And what we've done is we've essentially put our screener on the back. And this is an example of a kiddo. They've seen this kiddo in this. They see the same type of kid all the time. And you can see, you know, clearly they they have uh, uh, significant symptoms of depression. And this is what they would do. Okay, we got some depression. It's lasted for this long. Uh, fluoxetine and getting therapy. We're going to refer you to the general mental health place. And they would have felt really good about that. Now, in this particular time, when the kid flipped it over, look at what she included. She talked about her sexual assault, which was unknown to that provider, because um, no one had asked in the, in the past. And the trauma symptoms, again, unknown to the provider that, that she was having. He, they knew about the, the depression symptoms, didn't know about the trauma symptoms. So what was the right therapy for this kiddo? Um, was it general uh, community health therapy, or, or was it evidence-based trauma treatment? And that's what became clear with this one is that, yes, so you know, we still need support. It doesn't mean she doesn't have depression, but it certainly does mean that fluoxetine isn't the end-all, be all for this kiddo. And when it comes to getting this kid to the right next place, it wasn't a pediatric provider that was the right next place. It was ensuring this kid got referred to a pediatric provider who could deliver the type of therapy that could actually make her better. And, and that's really kind of from either a screening or a case finding approach, high intensity or high risk setting, low intensity, low risk setting. The idea that if you screen systematically, I'm, I'm routinely surprised about how moderate to severely impact, impacted children can look okay in my office. But if I don't do systematic symptom screening, I can often very much miss how severely impacted they are. And so if we take a step back and think about that um, we need to make sure these kids are safe, we need to make sure that they're not suicidal, and then we need data to make good decisions because I can't just look at this kid and say, oh, you need trauma treatment, or oh, you're going to be just fine. I need some data as at least the starting off point. And, and that really is essentially the work that we've been doing. And um, I'm four minutes over, but I really do appreciate the opportunity to share some of our work and efforts, and um, uh, hopefully the room is not empty and everyone's just left. So uh, thank you very much for your time. Brooks, thank you uh, very much. You're going to be on the panel. And um, could you have the panelists come up now, uh, Julian, Bill Jones, and Katie Nealon, and stay on line, uh, Brooks. Uh, Denny Doggart Wait. is going to be... Uh, Kind of presenting the questions from the audience to the panelists. Denny? Okay. So if the students could gather any more questions that are out there. Uh, second thing, the questions we don't get to on the bottom of your folder, there's the, the Behavioral Health Initiative um, website. We're going to be posting questions that we don't get to and answers, hopefully. Uh, that'll be out right after Thanksgiving. And so if you want to come on uh, to the website and ask those questions, that'll be great. Also, if you have any, any suggestions or any thoughts uh, that come to you after the program, if you'd like to do that, that would be also wonderful. Okay. Um, first question. Uh, uh, Dr. Ford, you had talked. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm neglecting my duty. Bill Jones and Katie Nealon are two people from the community. Uh, Bill Jones is the executive director of uh, the Wyoming Valley uh, United Way. Bill is a person I've been introduced to for about the last three years. Bill filters everything that the United Way and Wyoming County does through the trauma-informed lens and the poverty lens. And I'd like Bill to speak for a few minutes about uh, some of his experiences and how he came to this and why he uses that. And then Katie is one of our fourth-year students uh, soon to be Dr. Nealon, uh, and she will 
Uh, she has done some research and has had some personal experience uh, in the area of uh, trauma-informed treatment. So I would like them both to give us a little bit of their own personal reflections, if they could. Well, thank you very much. Is this sound okay? Is this good? Uh, well, I will tell you, I am the least scientific person in the room. I am, I am completely intimidated. Uh, uh, I do not know how the brain works. But um, at the United Way of Wyoming Valley, uh, we change the way that we serve the community. If you're familiar with the United Way model, you know that we've been a fundraising organization for you know, well over a century, and, and we try to raise money to help organizations serve the community. We quickly came to the realization that, that we will never be able to raise enough money just to keep meeting needs in the community. We needed to look at, at what we were doing and try to be more strategic and thoughtful about how we were using donor dollars to bring real lasting change. And so we took a study on, on those things that are creating and driving social service need in Wyoming Valley. And, and to make a long story short, after that study, we looked at, we really zeroed in on the issues of poverty. And now while we raise three and a half million dollars a year, if poverty could be resolved, it could, could be solved or eradicated with three and a half million dollars, it would have been done over and over and over. Of course it can't. So where, where could we focus? What, where could we be most Im impactful? So uh, uh, we focused on the issue, began to focus and look at the issues of childhood poverty. In the 2000 census, the poverty rate among children in Wyoming Valley was 14.7%. By the time we were doing our study in 2012, it had, it had grown from 14.7 to 29.6. It more than doubled in a 12 year period, means nearly one out of every three kids are growing up in poverty. It's way above the state and national averages. So we, we said, this is where we are called to, uh, to do our work. And so uh, we looked at the building blocks of the work that we do, education and health of children, the financial stability of families. In education, we were focused, really focused on graduation rates and, and the things that lead to graduating on time, grade level reading, early, you know, early school readiness, all of those kind of things. But we quickly realized that kids can't learn if they're not healthy. We also learned that kids can't learn if they're hungry. And so we still need to do, do some safety network in our community, and, and we are. But when we started looking at some health issues, this is where we, we I, I got startled. Um, in a group of, of um, you know, providers, we started learning about the incidences of abuse and neglect in Luzerne County. And so this is countywide data, and why we don't cover the entire county, we learned that, that in Luzerne County, um, we were, uh, two years ago, we were sixth out of 67 counties in the number of substantiated child abuse cases. And so we started looking into those, into those issues and the effects of trauma on, you know, those kids. And when we learned that, that, that you know, kids who are in foster care or, um, you know, have these you know, levels of trauma in their lives are, are less likely to do well in school, less likely to graduate on time, more likely to engage in risky behaviors and suicide, um, less likely to be healthy, you know, more likely to be un or underemployed f for their life um, throughout their lifetime, less likely to, uh, or more likely to have mental health issues and even premature death, all of these things. Um, so you know, encourage us, we need to get on the front end of these issues and try to use the charitable dollars of the community to attempt to be more preventative um, as opposed to focus on the issues of treatment. Um, so, so, like, I don't know, like many of you, I, I shouldn't make any of those assumptions, but I will admit that I've been guilty of, of you know, seeing somebody in the community and, and you know, Maybe helping that person get a job or something like that, lining up a job, and, and, and then they don't show up, or they get their first paycheck and spend it all on drinking and don't come back. And you, you wonder, and you become judgmental, and you say, what's wrong with them? Why are they doing that? And what we've learned in this is that is the wrong question to ask. It's not what's wrong with them. It's what happened to them. And so we started under, trying to understand all of the stuff that has been talked about today and, and try to you know, focus on, 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 on trauma issues. We learned about ACEs and ACE scores. And if you, if you 
don't know this name, I'd like to, if there's, there's nothing important that I say, if you're going to take notes on anything, I'd like, like to encourage you to look up, if you don't know this name, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. And if, if you Google, Google her name, there's a 16-minute TED Talk that is worth every second of your time to help explain all of this. So her name is Dr. Nadine Burke Harris. I ran to Philadelphia just to be able to meet her, get an autographed copy of her book. She just phenomenal work around all of this. She is encouraging awareness. I think if she were in this room today, she'd be thrilled that young students are getting exposed to, to this kind of discussion around ACEs. Um, and she's calling for universal screenings on these kind of things. Um, so as the United Way, we are funding things that are different, you know, very different than what we used to fund before. We are helping to, helping to fund programs that are helping kids be more successful uh, in school, avoid risky behaviors, um, and be more hopeful about their futures. And, and um, uh, Dr. Denny said, you know, talk about resiliency just a bit. And I, I will tell you in the work that we do, um, and, and it's about relationships. For us, if we could help kids improve a relationship, whether it's in their families and the relationships in their families, or at least with another caring adult, we could help kids um, uh, you know, develop the, that connection, that sense of belonging, that sense of hope, hopefulness for their future. And so um, uh, for, for us, it's, it's about you know, trying to build relationships. I'll stop there. <coughs> Hi guys, I'm Katie. Um, I have proportionally the shortest resume up here, so I'll try to take up the shortest amount of your time. Um, I'm a fourth year medical student who's been involved with um, ACEs and trauma-informed care for almost three years. Uh, I was just talking to Dr. Doggart about it. Um, the day that I met Dr. Doggart, I will never forget um, because he's wonderful, but also because I had had my wisdom teeth out two days before mm -hmm. and I was a swollen mess. Um, we kind of started this as a summer research project. I'm sure a lot of the students out there know that you have the opportunity to do some research between your first and second year. Um, and it started out small. Not a lot of people you know, were excited about ACEs, about trauma-informed care uh, that we knew of, at least on, on this campus. Um, and we started out with a little research project, finding out that 85% of our clinical faculty had never even heard of the ACE study. Uh, and then, you know, I'm not gonna take credit for this, but Dr. Doggart really kind of started beating down people's doors. And we brought it to immediately the highest level that we could. We brought it to Dean Scheinman, and he encouraged us to keep going. And we really felt like we needed to be part of a grassroots movement to kind of get a group of people together that weren't just doctors, um, all sorts of clinicians, social workers, people that are out there in the community to get together and to learn about this. So that's kind of my perspective. I've done some stuff with Dr. Doggart. I've also done a really awesome rotation at the Children's Advocacy Center that taught me a lot about interprofessional work. Um, and uh, I also have some personal experience. So before, um, when I started this, all of it was kind of distant to me. Um, I thought I wouldn't really make a difference. I thought, you know, this happens to other people. And then my nephews were the victims of abuse and neglect. And uh, they've been living with my father for the last year and a half. And I've been helping to raise them and to kind of combat the effects of what happened to them. Mm. And Ever since then, it's kind of hit a lot more home and been, you know, a lot more important to me. But I think it doesn't have to happen to you personally for you to be a part of something really big. And I think to all the medical students out there, you know, you don't have to be an old guy to, <laughs> you know... <laughs> To be up here and to be making a difference. And you um, probably don't want to be an old guy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's a place for you in advocacy and faces that look like mine that are 24 years old, 22 years old, 30 years old. There's a place for you in advocacy. There's a place for you in research. And there's a place for you to make a difference. So, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. No offense, like guys. <laughs>
So if I could ask uh, uh, care. Dr. Keeshan and Dr. Ford, there's several questions related to trauma and the onset of trauma, starting from someone asking if a mother is pregnant and in an abusive relationship, does that have an effect in utero on the child and will this child be at greater risk? Going on up to how do ACEs translate out into adulthood and the risks to adults? Could, could either or both of you address that? Brooks, I'll let you go first. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for letting me go with the easiest question. Um, that was supposed to be sarcasm. So, sorry. Um, so, can you all hear me still? Yes. Okay, great. So, you know, I think that the intergenerational transmission of ACEs and adversity and trauma is fascinating. And we know so much now about how mother sympathetic nervous system and, or, and the hormones can correlate with the infants and their young children. We know about how methylation, which is how the DNA turns on and off in terms of whether it's going to be making proteins or not making certain proteins, and how trauma and adversity can impact that. Um, so, so there's a ton of stuff that we know about how early, you know, very young experiences may be the pathways in which these children could be impacted by what mothers experience. But I do think that fundamentally, where we can still make it our most meaningful difference is in recognizing that the job of a child, a young child, is to have an attachment with their mother. And this is Orby, this is Ainsworth, I mean, this is, this is the fundamental bedrock of how we understand how children come into this world and thrive as young children. And, and if we have parents who are struggling, it is unreasonable to think that that struggle is not going to impact how they're able to develop their relationship and to respond to their child. And so I, I fundamentally think that, you know, although I am a big proponent and I have colleagues who do fascinating work in neurobi neurobiology and imaging, in hormones, in genetics, I do think that a lot of the intergenerational transmission of violence, uh, of traumatic stress, of, of trauma, of ACEs, is much more related to the fact that there are parents that are being impacted by what they experience, and that that impacts how they interact with their child and their child interacts with them. And I, and I think that that's encouraging because we have wonderful modalities out there to help mitigate those effects or to enhance the strength of parents. Um, so I'm a big believer in that intergenerational transmission, but I think that there's uh, both kind of relational as well as biological components that, that um, relate to that. And I will add, I'm in complete agreement, that I think when, when we think about how children are impacted by the traumatic experiences that their caregivers have had, that the other adults in their life, the kinds of adults that Mr. Jones is, is talking about who can play such a positive role in a child's life, and, and yet they may also be trauma survivors themselves, not necessarily, or they may be dealing with intense stress reactions. And we think about the, the way in which a health care provider, like soon to be Dr. Nealon, can have an enormous impact on not just the child, but on their caregiver. And that's where I think uh, Dr. Keishan's point is particularly important. We're not talking just about helping children deal with adversity. We're talking about helping their caregivers and sometimes multiple generations, sometimes a generation currently that's helping to care for children who've experienced trauma, even though she's not a primary caregiver but maybe she is a primary caregiver, just not a biologically connected m mother in this case. So we're, we're really talking about, when we think about intergenerational transmission, there, there's the potential for intergenerational transmission of traumatic stress reactions. And that's the kind of survival reaction that we've been talking about, and the hypervigilance. But there's also the potential for intergenerational transmission of resilience. 
Um, and there's actually some really interesting evidence on that in longitudinal studies that showed that people can pass along across generations the ability to be resistant to trauma, to be resilient in the face of trauma, to recover after having experienced very serious emotional, behavioral, and medical difficulties. So we're really thinking about intergenerational transmission that we don't know that much about how genes are affected and how methylation occurs and how genes are turned off and on epigenetically when children are exposed to the best kind of caregiving, which is the caregiving that's supported by resources like the United Way, mm -hmm. caregiving that's supported by and that's informed by the practice of healthcare providers like Dr. Keishan and soon to be Dr. Nealon, and by, by all of us when we support adults who have the opportunity to care for children, we're, we're also supporting the children and maybe the, the next generation as well. Okay, um, again, if I can ask Dr. Keishan and Dr. Uh, Ford, one of the questions was trauma and brain changes and you know, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, how treatable and is it lifelong or is it something that can be reversed at some point? Well, I'll take the hard question first, Brooks. <laughs> I think that Dr. Keishan has, has given us a great example of how post-traumatic stress can be identified if we ask the right questions and if we do so in a way that's sensitive and gives people a chance, kids as well as caregivers, to tell us what has happened in their lives without requiring that and sometimes to work that through when therapies that involve talking about and figuring out what happened to me, like trauma-focused CBT, and other times in therapies like Target where you're figuring out how it's affecting you now and understand why you react in the way you do and how it's not because you're crazy or because there's something wrong with you. It's because something, as Mr. Jones said, has happened to you and you've had to adapt, and you've adapted very resiliently. So there, there's strong evidence that these interventions, as Dr. Keishan showed, that these psychological, to a large extent, psychosocial interventions that work with kids, that work with their relationships, their caregivers, can be highly effective in helping kids to recover from post-traumatic stress and not develop a lifelong disorder or problem. But we have to keep one thing in mind, and that is that when you're a trauma survivor, you have memories that are never erased, just as all of our memories are not erased, not just trauma memories. And those memories can be reactivated at times as we grow and go through stages of life and changes and different periods in our lives, different relationships. And so it's not at all uncommon for a child who may have received excellent treatment to years and years later, even decades later, to have a reactivation of some of the post-traumatic stress symptoms. And that can be dealt with very effectively and treatment can be highly effective if the individual if that individual and their caregivers have learned that that's perfectly expectable, it doesn't mean that you're slipping or that you, you've got a, a disease that you will never get over. What it means is that there's still some parts of those experiences that you're needing to figure out and work through. And that's what treatment actually provides. So treatment is not a one-time only deal. It's not only that, you, that we need to follow kids and adults who've experienced trauma when, they've, when they're receiving treatment, as Dr. Keishan said, but we need to prepare them for the fact that they may, they may have some of these same reactions at later points in their lives, and that is not a sign that they're slipping or that they have a chronic illness necessarily. It's a sign that it's time to do some more work. And if you've done it successfully one time, then you know that that's not a terrible thing to have to do again. In fact, it may be the best possible thing because it might be the beginning of a whole new chapter in your life and additional resilience. So that, that's my long answer to a very good question. No, it's not lifelong. Yes, it's treatable. There are effective treatments. And those treatments may be needed periodically across a person's lifespan. Dr. Keishan? So, so I, I, I completely agree with Dr. Ford. If you were wanting us to, you know, have a, um, an argument, I think we probably picked the wrong topic for that. Um, <laughs> okay, well, let me pick up a topic that maybe we could all argue but I, but I can, can I just say one? I do want to say one other thing that I find, I think my role is really important in 
because I'm a psychiatrist. And so I see families in a trauma treatment clinic. That's my, that's one of my main clinical jobs. And one of my main clinical interventions with the families I see is in complimenting, reassuring, and acting as a cheerleader to the families of how they have advocated for their child to get them the right treatment, which will help their child be better. It's not a prescription of medicine, which I do not do much and I do very few of, uh, but really it's in uh, validating what the families have done to get here and being a cheerleader as part of the team. And I think it, it just recognizes that that's, that's oftentimes the most effective role I can play in some of these kids in recognizing that, yes, it's a little it's difficult now, but we're at a place that will give you the best chance for full recovery. And, you know, as we move forward, I'm happy to be a part of that team, but, but the treatment is the psychosocial intervention. And one... Uh Two final questions. With the one that I think is really an interesting question um, relates to health systems. Um, and why do health systems not see the benefits to incorporating trauma screening into their programs because it affects children, it affects parents, it affects long term health? And could you comment if you've experienced a health system that has done that or how it's been done successfully? Dr. Keeshan and Dr. Ford. Oh, I have a question for you, too. I think Dr. Keeshan is giving us a wonderful example of how it can be done. Tell us more about Intermountain and why, why, why are all those clinic directors so willing to work with you and with all the burden that you're increasing on them? Uh, talking so, about <laughs> so I would say that, that it really is in making the argument. It, it, it's beyond... The argument that, so our Child Abuse Center has been around for a long time, and everyone loves our Child Abuse Center here. It's called the Center for Safe and Healthy Families because it deals with topics that many folks do not want to deal with. But the issue of why do they, why are they seeing themselves as willing to get involved is because we needed to make the, to the clinicians, the clinical argument about how this actually changes a clinical decision that you're going to do in your, in your practice. It, it's not just a matter of it's important to affect, uh, identify these kids for some kind of altruistic good or that we're identifying a higher risk population that we need to monitor closely over time. It's that we've actually worked with them to help develop something that, that assists them in making a pertinent and relevant clinical decision, whether it's about trauma treatment or not, whether it's about starting an SSRI or not, whether it's about starting a stimulant or not. It helps them make an important clinical decision. And from the payer standpoint, we have demonstrated within our system, with everyone knowing that we're the trauma treatment center, one of the trauma treatment centers, that over and over and over again, kids get sent to the wrong individual at first. And so from a payer standpoint, they don't want to pay for the kid going and getting six sessions with a therapist who, quote, doesn't do trauma, and then at session six, they identify, whoa, there's more trauma stuff here, and you need to go someplace else. There's actually a, a huge financial incentive beyond the fact that it's better care and better for the family and quicker return to prior level of functioning for the child. It's cheaper to get the kid to the right place the first time. And so increasing the accuracy and increasing the variation all those pieces that improve quality. And it's, and it's a matter, I think, about speaking the language of the folks you're working with. Whether the payers want to hear about one thing, the providers want to hear about something else. We're not trying to be two-faced, but we're trying to help them understand how this is important to them. Dr. Yu, can I ask you to join us for one last question? Well, I just actually have a question about Brooks's comments and, and Julian's comments about resources that are necessary in order to do what we're talking about. You know, behavioral health has always uh, taken a back seat to medicine and surgery. Right? Now, there are many different reasons why that's the case. Some of it of, of our own doing, where we have not articulated clearly what it is that we're all about. And, and on the other side, medicine and surgery not really understanding what we're all about. And so in health systems, which I'm most familiar with, 
supporting med medical surgical uh, operations are much more lucrative uh, than supporting behavioral health. So the question I have for both Brooks and for Julian, and maybe for other people in the audience, how do you get a health system to do what is necessary to support what a community needs? That's a basic question. It's not about, so Brooks, I would have a question for you. The, the data that you refer to on it's cheaper to do it the way that you've described, where are those data that can help drive the changes that are necessary in health systems so that these things can be incorporated more effectively based upon what the need of the community is. The community here knows what it needs. I'm convinced of that. And other communities around the country knows, knows what they need. And some communities have responded. Mass General is a place that I'm aware of that has responded to the needs of its community by initiating programs that are exceptional. What needs to happen here in order to make that happen? You want me to go first, or Julian, do you want to go? Brooks, go right ahead. I'll follow up and finish. So, so I, I think there, there's, there's a lot in there. And from a starting off point, it really is deciding, is your system a fee-for-service patient health system, or is it a uh, capitated or uh, population health system? And I think that when we're talking about mental health resources, the argument for how evidence-based treatment is effective for the system actually has to start with that fundamental principle of are we fee-for-service, and that's our patient health system, or are we more of a population health system? Because the metrics that we need to demonstrate are very different for those two systems. And in, in, within our mountain, it's a hybrid. So we actually have to talk both languages. And we talk about, in, in our system, we demonstrate the length of stay in our, in our treatment program. And we demonstrate the length of stay in the community mental health program that we can show um, the decreased length of stay in our treatment program. We demonstrate uh, the... Um, overall improvement of symptoms in our evidence-based treatment. So there, there are those metrics, but I think on a broader sense, when we're looking at a population, we have to think about, well, what are the things that we're seeing among our children that are using the highest resources? And are we able to deliver lighter touch interventions, a stepped care approach that basically starts with the least intensive and least costly intervention, and that's delivered among the broader set of individuals that normally would receive care. So a higher upfront cost, higher per person cost, but has the potential, and this is what we're going to be following because we don't have the data to support this yet with what we're doing. They have this with other mental health integration data in, in the intermountain system, so that's why they're willing to believe us. But you then decrease the utilization of the higher cost uh, systems. Uh, the inpatient, the emergency room care, you know, those types of things. So, so it really does get to, um, you know, the, the idea that we all can agree about ACEs and childhood trauma and that from a community standpoint, we want to support these kids. But what Intermountain did for 15 years is that they created a little bubble and they said that you could never grow because you lose money. And we want to make sure we have the service but we don't want to grow it because if you grow it, it just costs us even more money. And so we're trying to change that metric. And one of the ways was by evidence-based treatment and demonstrating compared to other models out there, we actually kept kids for shorter periods of time. And we actually just did a study recently, haven't been published yet, where we demonstrated that with that CFTSI, that early intervention, uh, we dramatically reduced uh, the overall duration of treatment in our clinic. Um, by about two months, actually, um, if you look at per kid basis. And we decreased the cost, I think, by $1,000 a kid on average in our clinic, um, just by introducing that light touch intervention as part of our array of services. But then I think more broadly, there does need to be this understanding of what is the cost to the system 
And are there things that we think, if we catch them early, it will increase cost per child initially, like vaccines do? It is inherently more expensive to give a vaccine than not give a vaccine on a per child basis. However, on a public health standpoint, it's inherently much cheaper to vaccinate children than not. And that's where I think, depending on your system, uh, and you might have to make both arguments, but you have to think, I think, about both of those aspects. Katie? Oh, yeah. So I just wanted to give an update with regard to the Geisinger system. Um, probably not a lot of people know this, but down in Danville, some of the pediatrics residents in their own clinic have started incorporating ACE screening as kind of a regular clinical activity. So I think that from the standpoint of our health system, we can hopefully start to see some data on that coming out in the next few years, because this was kind of a recent thing that started in March, April. Great. When we look at, when we look at some really good evidence-based practices, like nurse family partnership, for example, to, to engage a family who's at risk right at birth or even prenatal, and spend dollars early in life, we could, we, it's hard to measure what gets prevented later in life, but if we could help direct those families and get them off to a better start in life in terms of nutrition and health you know, screenings and get them directed to the right services that leads to school readiness and, and kids doing better and parents being stronger and families being stronger, that investment early in life is well worth uh, that, that ounce of prevention is well worth the pound of cure. And I think as a society, if we, if we start investing earlier in life, in the lives of children, they will do better. It becomes less expensive. I would rather fund education. I would rather fund these kind of things than prisons and expensive medicines or medical procedures. And I will just say, I. I think all of these points are crucial because every argument that can be brought to bear has to be brought to bear because there's always some objection, costs too much, takes too much time, adds too much burden, isn't feasible in our system. I would like to say that the, in addition to everything that you've heard, that a crucial piece of this is that we're talking about a way to make not just patients healthier, but a workforce healthier. Entire community healthier. And community healthier. And if we're talking about healthcare systems, we're, we're talking about thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who deliver services, who are highly stressed in many cases, who are often working with individuals, families, who are experiencing these kinds of stress reactions that are not identified, and then they're trying to do the best they can, delivering the services that they know how, but they don't have the tools in many cases to be able to deliver exactly the kinds of screening, careful identification, targeted treatment when it's needed, as it's needed, in the right, in the right sequence. So I think that one of, the, one of the great advantages here is the opportunity to bring to bear a, an approach from the very initial encounter, as Dr. Keishan is saying, right through the most intensive treatment that actually provides the workforce and the community with a greater degree of health. And when you think about it also, the uh, interventions that we're talking about, if you think about the practice steps from trauma-focused CBT and you think about the freedom steps from target, those are approaches that when we teach this to people in the healthcare fields or anywhere, what we almost always hear is, oh, I can use that too. That's something that, do I have to be a trauma survivor to use this approach? No, you don't. Do you have an alarm in your brain that goes off that sometimes leads you to feel stressed and take your work home and wish that you could just get another job and quit and leave and all those kinds of reactions or that you just don't have to see one more patient who is not doing what they're told and not following the treatment recommendations, maybe because that patient is saying, you know, this is not what I need. This is not the most helpful thing. So I would suggest that workforce and community health can actually be an enormous benefit and a cost reduction from bringing this kind of approach into a healthcare system. I think this school is an example of the power of a community. 
The fact that this school was formed based upon the recognition by the community of what it requires. And it's that strength that I think is necessary now to make the changes that are necessary in the health systems that exist within Lackawanna and Lucerne counties and northeastern Pennsylvania. <clears throat> there is some return on investment now starting to come back to this area through people who have been trained at this medical school, who have gone on to residencies and are now starting to repopulate this area, which is, is incredible. But there need to be changes in the health system, that, in the health systems that exist here, to change the game that exists within Lackawanna and Lucerne counties and northeastern Pennsylvania. That's what I'm talking about. How do you mount that effort and get the attention of health systems that exist here in order to make the changes that are necessary based upon the needs of the population that live here? So, I'm, uh, I'm not so interested in, in being polite about this because I think that it's necessary to, to go forward and try to push and make a difference. And, and we need help. We need help from the outside coming in. We need help from people such as are on the panel today. Um, there's a lot of stuff that has to be done. And, and all of you who live in this community know that to be true because I've spoken with many of you. We need to do this as a community. So I want to thank you very much for coming. Thank our panelists and our participants. Brooks, thank you for uh, going beyond the call of duty. Uh, we really appreciate it. <laughs>